everybody, hey, real quick, if you guys don't know yet, I'm just going to go ahead and call you out real fast. Everybody say, hey, Ben Swan. Ben Swan is a part of the traveling duo of the Ben Swan brothers and does a fantastic job. And he's one of our worship leaders. And I think he's a pretty good looking guy, which is a little bit awkward. I don't like being in the same camera shot as you, but that just happened. Yeah, I'd run. I'd run. But anyway, we're excited that Ben's hanging out with us today. And if this is your first time, let me just say welcome. My name is Patrick, and uh, we're so glad that you are here. Um, And thanks for coming, too, on Labor Day weekend. A lot of you could be at the boat right now. Some of you may be wishing you were at the boat right now, but I promise we're going to come back around. It's going to be a fun service today. And now when you came in, we gave you a program, and I wanted to walk you through just a couple of announcements uh, that we have going on at our campus and give you a couple of things that are going on here. And the first thing is for all of the fellas in the room, uh, we have an annual kind of retreat that we do called Man Up. And Man Up is going to be an amazing thing that we do again every year. And what we do is we all go to Spring Hill Camp, which is about an hour and a half away uh, from here. And there's all sorts of fun things that we do uh, at, the, at the Spring Hill Camp. Uh, so Man Up is coming up. It's going to be October 6th through the 8th. And we'd love for you to join us with that. Uh, you can actually sign up online at kensingtonchurch.org slash man up. And I'll tell you this, if you've never been to one of these weekends before, um, I, I, I know if you're anything like me, I'm pretty introverted. And there's a thing that goes, I don't really want to just travel, be alone with a group of guys that I don't know. I totally get it. But I promise you this, that if you talk to anybody who's ever been, if you've talked to any of the people here that have been to one of these offsites, they'll, they'll tell you that it's one of the most amazing weekends that you could experience. There's so much fun things that we do. And there's really this interaction that you have with a group of guys that you just don't get until you get away with each other and you figure out how bad men actually smell when they don't shower for three days. So it's really a fun weekend. So we'd love for you to join us for this. Again, it's uh, October 6th through the 8th, and you can sign up online. Uh, the second thing I want to let you know about is we have a Family Ministries volunteer kickoff coming up, and uh, that's actually why I'm wearing this shirt. And so uh, this uh, this coming uh, in a couple of weeks in uh, September, I believe 6th, uh, from 6 to 8.30, so this is this week, uh, we're doing a big kickoff for all of our Family Ministries volunteers, and we would love for you to join us. Uh, we're giving out these shirts, so you have the possibility to win one of these shirts. Uh, we're actually bringing in a chef uh, to do all all of the food. It's going to be a fun night. You're going to get to hear all about what's going on uh, in family ministries in this upcoming year. So we'd love for you to be a part. Uh, And then I'd also say, if you're somebody that's just interested in volunteering, if you're someone that's kind of on the fringe and, you know, your wife's been talking to you about it for, you know, the last six months, or your husband's been talking to you about it, or you've had kids come up and grab you and say, will you please, whatever that is, uh, this would be a great opportunity for you to come and just kind of see what we're all about uh, in family ministries as well. And if nothing else, you get some great food. So that's that's a win all the way around. But we'd love for you to join us uh, for that volunteer kickoff. Uh, again, it's this Wednesday night uh, is when we're going to be doing that. Um, and then the third thing I want to let you know about is our leadership gathering. Uh, at Kensington, uh, we do leadership gathering twice a year. Uh, and this is for those of you who are really invested and a part of what we're doing here at our Kensington Traverse City campus and really all of our campuses. What we do is we go down state and we uh, are a part of the leadership gathering down there. We have speakers that come in, but then you get to hear from our founders and really get a preview of the direction that we're going in this next season uh, of our ministry. And so we'd love for you to join us for that. The music's amazing. There's all sorts of fun things that happen at this. Uh, But we'd love for you to join us for that. That's going to be September 15th. Uh, It's going to be at our Orion campus downstate, and we'd love for you to join us uh, down there as well. The last thing I wanted to let you know about, um, a lot of you have been tracking on the news over the last probably week and a half, and you've uh, kind of seen what's been going on uh, in Houston over the last uh, last little bit. And uh, for the last, uh, really about a week, we've had people that have been reaching out to us as a church and saying, you know, what are we doing or how can I get involved? And a lot of you may or may not know, but we actually have funds that go or set aside uh, to be a part of these kind of incidents and these kinds of things that we just want to be able to partner with people that are on the ground with. And so we have two churches. Uh, right now that we are uh, really helping and supporting uh, that are on the ground right now working in the Houston area. And one of those churches, uh, the pastor is actually from Kensington. He was a student pastor here for a long time. Years and years ago, we've been supporting this church for a long time. And they are really in the thick of it. So when you look at the volunteers that have been a part of that, that are kind of navigating through all that's going on there, what you're seeing is is a lot of churches that are involved and even their church that are really kind of jumped in and helping with all that's going on. And so a lot of you have been asking how you you can give. Uh, And so what I want to do is I want to go ahead and invite the ushers to move forward. Uh, We're going to receive our offering in a second, but I want to let you know of two ways specifically uh, that you can give just uh, to the Houston Houston area. And so there's really two of the easiest ways to give here, and I want to show you this. Uh, You can do it through our app, or you can do it through texting. I'm going to walk you through what this looks like. Um, But you can go to our Kensington Church app, and there's there's an area on there that says uh, Hurricane Harvey Relief, right? So you can jump on board with that. 
Um, and you can just click that link and give right there from your smartphone online in about 10 seconds. So that happens really fast. The other option that you have, uh, if you don't have the app, is you can send a text message with the word Kensington uh, to the number 77977. So 77977. And what's going to happen is you're going to get a link right back within seconds of you sending that text message. When you do that, um, you're going to get a link and you just cl- simply click on that link and it's going to walk you through the process of giving online. And those are really the two easiest ways to give uh, both to these sorts of things and really just to Kensington uh, as a whole. If you're looking to give, a lot of you do that. Uh, Our family gives online. I think most of our staff do that. Uh, And and the bulk of the people that actually attend our church give somewhere on our app or online. That's just one of the easiest ways uh, to do that. But know that that's how we're involved. We know that there's a lot of organizations that you could give to, a lot of great places that you can give to, but this is just uh, the specific way that our church is diving in and and hopefully making an impact uh, down there. So today... uh, Um, We're kicking off a brand new series called Circles, and today what we're doing is we're going to be talking about your friendships, your relationships, even your dating relationships a little bit through uh, this series, and so we're going to have a little bit of fun before we jump into the message today. So I hear the 9 o'clock crowd likes to have a little bit of fun. Is that true? Are you guys a little bit amps? I feel like you're the rowdy bunch, Is that specifically in this section. Am I right? Right in here, you guys a little bit... Yeah, you're a little bit crazy. If you're not, you're like, what's wrong with these people? That's all right. Uh, So we're going to have some fun. Before we do that, though, I'd love for you to go ahead and stand up. Give three or four people around you a high five and ask them this question. Ask them, where is your favorite Traverse City burger spot? Right? So you're going to eat burgers this weekend. Where's your favorite Traverse City burger spot? Well, hey, good morning. Uh, as Patrick said, this is 9 o'clock service. You guys are a little rowdy, right? Okay, never mind. We'll take it back. Well, well first, let's just make sure. We are all won yesterday, Michigan and Michigan State won, right? So we're all feeling good. Uh, here's what I need. Uh, to start things off today, we're going to have a little fun. I have two people who are going to come up here, Eric and where's my friend Doug. Uh, they're coming up here, and we're going to play a little game, but here's what's going to happen. They're going to need your help potentially. And so Eric is a good friend of mine. Uh, one thing that I love about Eric is he's funny. One thing I hate about Eric is he's a Michigan State fan. And so Eric is going to represent the Michigan State Spartans today. <laughs> Doug, Doug over here is one of my favorite people because he's a Michigan fan. And so Doug's got probably the judge's help today. So uh, these two... Poor souls don't know what they got themselves into, but it's going to be really easy. Since today, we're talking about friendships and the people that you surround yourself with. Everyone's got a best friend, right? Most of us have a best friend, hopefully. Uh, We're going to show a couple of pictures on the screens here, and you guys can look straight back there, of a person, and you need to hit this button when you know who maybe their best friend may be. And so your job out here is you guys can help these guys win. And so you can yell it out if you know, but it's going to go by whoever slaps this button that says, oh, it's not making the sound. That's it. Oh, now it did. It says that was easy. Uh, But you're going to help them try to get this thing done. Uh, And just so you guys know, there is a prize. And that prize is Moomers. And so we got a Moomers gift card to whichever one of you wins. And so uh, you guys ready? Uh, They're ready. Eric, you ready? Ready. All right. So let's see the first one here. The first one. Oh, Doug got their first. Ken. Ken, one point for Michigan. There we go. I didn't hear anybody help out there. And actually, I'm a little alarmed by how fast you got that. Like that, he's got a daughter. Okay, never mind. So he's like, this is right up my alley. All right, so we got one point for blue, zero for state. We should just end right now, right? No, here we go. All right, let's go. see the next one. Ooh. What is it? Robin. Robin, it's two to nothing. Let's go, blue. Oh, Eric. You should get your hand closer. I think that might help. I need my coffee. No, no, no. No coffee. We don't have time for that. Here we go. Next one. (laughs) Butthead. Is it butthead? Where is that butthead? Beaver. Yay! It is two to one. I don't know. I wasn't allowed to watch that show, so I don't know. All right. Next one. Luke. Luke. 
Chewbacca. <laughs> That's my bet. Fun fact, I've never seen a Star Wars movie. Whoa! Hot take of the day. That's hot take of the day. <laughs> All right, so it's three to one. We're running out of time here. All right, next one. <laughs> Doug's cleaning house today. Ernie. That's Ernie. Is that Bert and Ernie? Hey! All right, Eric, you got you to gotta pour it on right now because I don't think there's very many left. All right, let's see. It's four to one. Chandler. <laughs> He's just picking up the scraps over here. You better you better buy her an ice cream cone, maybe. He's, <laughs> all right, it's five. I'm not even keeping track. It's a bloodbath. Here we go. Five to one, I think. Come on, that's Lloyd Christmas. Harry. Harry! You just listen to these guys. You gotta help over here. It's just like college. It's just like college. He's cheating off the smart kid. All right, Ed, Lloyd, and Harry. All right. Oh, no. Jelly. Is there a mercy rule? It's jelly. Peanut butter jelly time. Nope, no one? All right, we'll, we'll run that back. I think we got one more here. Nope. Ooh. Patrick? Hey! A middle schooler just helped you out, I think, but you, you can take that one. All right, I think there's last one here. <laughs> Hutch? Hutch starts the end. I don't know which one that is. It's a, it doesn't matter. Give these two guys a round of applause. Doug, Eric, go blue. I'll get you a movers card later. <laughs> and so since they got to have some fun now, I want us all to have some fun. So here's the deal. I know if you're like me, one of the best things you can do with your friends is sing along. So here, I want everyone to stand up. We're going to get warmed up today. We're going to sing a song that I think everybody knows. Sing it there, together. Woo. Get the hands going. I want to hear everyone sing it. Come on. Listen, baby. church this morning. Someone's feeling it this morning. Hey, give yourselves a round of applause. All right, hey, that was Ain't No Mountain High. We're going to go through a couple here. We'll see how well you do. This one strikes a chord for me. This one takes me back to 2000. 2000 boy band. Oh, you know what it is. Ryan, you got this? Got it. Let's go. You are Come on. There's a couple people that this is hitting a spot. <laughs> oh, yeah. What? Backstreet Boys. This is the Backstreet Boys. Now, I'm nervous for this one because I know as soon as you hear this, somebody might stand on a chair. And so I want to encourage you, please don't stand on a chair because this one's going to hit a spot for a lot of us. Uh-oh. So here's what I want you to Let's get a sway going. Let's get a sway to the left. There you go. There you go. Now we're feeling it. Where it began. Oh, here we go. You know it. I can't begin to knowing 
But then I know it's growing strong. All right, but we gotta get the sway back. Was in the spring. Then spring became the summer. Who'd have believed you'd come along? All right, let's get the hands out. Let's get them up. Let's get spirit hands. Hands. Touching hands. Let's see him reach out. Reaching out. Touching me. All right, let's hear everybody on this one. Yeah. I'm so excited. All right, one more. Last one. We're going to have some fun. The greatest TV show of all time. I know you know it. fun to sing together you guys sounded great we're gonna do something similar right now we're gonna sing to our great god we're gonna sing a song called shine a light and it's just a declaration of sharing this joy that we all have when we can sing a familiar song together that maybe we grew up with but we can have that same joy here singing a song to god vertically so i just encourage you guys let's sing this together
see a miracle happen. So just get your hands up like this. Come on, let's sing it out. You guys sounded great. So excited to be with you through the Circle Series. At this time, you can just turn around and have a seat. Check out this video. How many friends do you have on social media? I probably have like 400 followers on Instagram. Not that, like maybe 250. On Twitter, like 1,000. Probably about 700. How many are actual real friends in your life? Anywhere between like 20, 30, something like that. Maybe like 50. 75. People I actually know, probably like 500. Maybe 100. Maybe even less than that. How many are people you could kind of be vulnerable and real with? Mm, probably half of that bunch. 25. Probably four or five. Probably 20. Maybe 30 tops. How many could you call at 2 in the morning and know a personal crisis? Oh, uh, probably another half of that. Yeah, about seven or eight. Oh my gosh, like 10. Maybe seven. Those four or five. Those four or five. Maybe five. Yeah, I've probably seen five of those friends. So today, we're kicking off a brand new series called Circles, and what we're going to be doing over the course of the next three weeks is really talking about the relationships that you have, the relationships that I have, and how we interact in those relationships. And so let me ask you a quick question before we jump in. You heard a little bit about social media, so just as like a quick poll, how many of you would say that you have Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Anybody out there with Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Okay. Now let me ask you this one. How many of you would say that you have more friends on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter than you you like are actually close to and that you don't know, right? If you were really honest, how many of you have a few more? I have a lot of friends on Facebook that I don't really even know. My wife makes fun of me sometimes. She goes, do you even know that person? I'm like, sure. We, you know, we were in sixth grade together. It was great, you know? How many of you, now be really honest, now you're in church, so you can't lie, right? So how many of you use this to mildly and slightly inappropriately stalk other people from your childhood? Anybody else do that? I'm raising my hand. I'm with you. Yeah, so that's kind of what we do. And when it comes to friendships, <laughs> you're like, did I say that in church? Yeah. Uh, when it comes to friendships, when it comes to relationships, what's fascinating for us is that when it comes to like social media platforms, when it comes to things online, we have a lot of friends. But if you were to ask people a generation ago or two generations ago, maybe even three generations ago, the word friend meant something different. It was a different kind of thing. In fact, it was probably a more close and uh, intimate sort of relationship you knew each other's family. Like it was just a different thing than the way that we use the word friend or even follower uh, today. And so, so during the series, what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time talking about your relationships, and we're going to talk about it within a visual, uh, like with these circles. And we're going to talk about where to put your friends and how you navigate all of those relationships. But before we jump in, what I wanted to do is I wanted to get us all united around one idea, whether you're a follower of Jesus, you're not a follower of Jesus, no matter where you are on the age spectrum, faith spectrum, you know, gender, you know, wherever you are, there's one thing that we can all agree on, and that thing is this. Now, for us, right, most of the important moments in our lives are shared by those who are, what's that word? 
closest to us, right? Most of the important moments in our lives are shared by those who are closest to us. Now, if you're a parent in the room, you know this without a shadow of a doubt. If you're a teenager in the room, you probably also know this without a shadow of a doubt. And the reason that you know this is because those of you who are parents, you believe this so deeply that you turn into the NSA when it comes to your, you know, teenager cell phones. Is that right? Like, you know everything that there is to know about them. You're like, you know, wiretapping to a whole new level with you. When your daughter goes on a date, you have find my iPhone and you've even snuck like a GPS tracker in her, you know, purse and you even snuck it on her boyfriend. Like, you know exactly where they are at all times, right? You, you, you kind of eavesdrop in the car. Not Some of you know this. Think about it. Anybody with middle schoolers in the room? Any middle school parents? You know what I'm talking about? So you're in the car and you become a master at this where you sit in the car and you just prompt them with a question. You know, you talk about Taylor Swift. You know, what do you think about Taylor Swift? And you're just listening, right, to their, their, their responses and they don't think you are, but you are. And you're like a professional eavesdropper. You know everything that they're saying. And the reason that you care so much is because of this, that the important moments of their lives, right, the important moments of their lives are absolutely shaped by the relationships they have and those close relationships they have. Now, for me, uh, when I was in middle school, I uh, had a big crush on this girl. Um, surprise, surprise. And I, I asked her out on a date. Now, in middle school, you know, if you know this, if you have a middle schooler, especially if you have an introverted middle schooler, that by the time you ask somebody out, that doesn't ever mean that they're going to talk. That just means that they're going out, right? And so that's what happened with me. I asked this girl out with very little intention of actually putting, uh, taking her on a date, very little intention of actually talking to her at all because that was me in sixth grade. And so my mom thought it would be really fun, kind of an experiment to say, so you're going out with her? And I'm like, yeah. She goes, well, where are you going? And I'm like, that's a good question. I don't, we don't really have a plan for that. She goes, I have an idea. Why don't we go out and I'll take you both on your first date? And I was like, okay. So we, we go out on this date. Now this is kind of how this works in our family. She thought this was a great idea. And so we go, you know, she actually talked to the, the, the girl's parents ahead of time, let her know what she was going to do. And so we, we both, we get in the car in this minivan because, you know, Hey, and so we get in the car in the minivan. She drives us to the movie theater. And so she goes, you guys can go ahead and get out and get your tickets. And I'm all like, here we go. I open the door for the girl. We walk up to the ticket booth. I get her tickets. My mom had given me enough money to buy popcorn for her, you know. So we get into the theater. Little did I know that my mom was planning on joining us. (laughs) So we sit down in the movie theater. My mom's like, this is cute. Oh, you didn't think I was going to be here? And she sits two rows behind us, the whole movie. Didn't watch the movie. And she's just sitting there popping popcorn like, I'm watching. And the reason that she is, is because she knows that if it was going to be this going out thing or this dating thing, right? The people that are closest to me are going to be around me for these important moments in my life. And that relationship lasted about one date, right? So that was how that worked. Now, the reason this is important is because if you're a parent, you know this. You know that when it comes to your kids that the people they surround themselves with really matter. But a lot, a lot of times for us, as we get to like high school or college, a lot of us for some point in college, we knew that as a kid, as parents on this side of it, we know it for our kids, but we ignore this idea when it comes to our own life. And the problem with that is that our defining moments, right, the defining moments of your life are often connected to an experience or a decision that you made with friends. Now, we ignore this as we get into adulthood for some reason, and I'm not sure why. But when we get into adulthood, we think that this is something like for our kids, or we think this is something for middle schoolers, or this is something for high schoolers. But here's what I would ask you, right? If you were to fast forward to high school or college, did you take your first drink alone, or were there other people with you? Or if you were to think about the big moments in your life as you started thinking about a career, right? Did you think about your career in isolation only, or did you actually surround yourself with a group of people who were speaking into the career that you were going to have? Now, let me ask you this. For those of you maybe who are single, you're out, of, you know, you're out of college, maybe you're dating, you know, wherever you are there. If you're single, right, when it comes to the, the guys that you want to date or the girls that you want to date, you don't make those decisions really by yourself, right? Like, I, I don't understand this. I think a lot of those decisions are made with women in the women's restroom because they all go together to the bathroom together. And I think they talk about stuff. I feel like it's a code. I don't know how it works, but you're talking to people about whatever decisions it is that you're making. You have a few, a few friends that you probably run those things by. Guys do the same thing. They just, you know, they don't go to the bathroom to do that. They just talk about it over the phone or they're texting. And it's like more like grunts kind of text. You know, it's just, that's how it works. And there's this interesting thing for us. 
When it comes to our relationships, the defining moments of our lives, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to spouses, when it comes to careers, all of those are really made in the context of relationships with other people. Now, for those of you who are business leaders, you work, you know, in the marketplace, think about this. That merger that you were part of, those business decisions that you're making, those of you who are leaders in your company, now think about it. You're not really making those decisions alone or in isolation, or I hope you're not. You have a, a core group of people around you that are helping you make those decisions. So when it comes to your friendships, not only are they important, and not only are they a part of your past, but we could say this. The friendships are more than a part of our past. They shape, and I don't miss this, they shape the better part of our future. They shape the better part of our future. That if you want to fast forward to where you're going to end up in five years or seven years or ten years, oftentimes what you can do is you can look to the people, not only that are your friends on Facebook, those people that are core kind of to, to your friendships, the core group of people, If you fast forward five years or seven years, it's really going to be the culmination of that group of people. And that's not a new concept, right? In fact, the writers of the Bible actually talk about this. There's an area in a a, a book of the Bible called Proverbs, right? And there's just all of these sort of wise sayings. And it says this, walk with the wise and become wise. But I want you to read this with me. For a companion of fools suffers what? Harm. And you know this when it comes to other people. And you know this when it comes to your kids. What I want to do today is I want to talk about your relationships. And I don't want you to think about your spouse's relationships. I don't want you to think about your boyfriend or girlfriend or whoever you came with today. I don't want you to think about their relationships. Because that's easy to do. Because it's easy to evaluate other people. What I want to do is I want you for the next few minutes to think about your relationships. Those people who you are close to and those people who are speaking deeply into your life or even slightly into your life. Because I believe this with all my heart. Those people are shaping your future, and we have to make decisions about how we navigate those people together. Now, the great thing about the Bible is that when you open it up, there are entire narratives of these groups of people. In fact, in the Old Testament, you find a lot of biographies about people, and you get these, these pictures of people who did it well, and those are less fun to read for me. But then you get those, those images of people who did it so bad that it's almost like this epic story of failure, right? It's these epic stories of failure where you look at them and you're like, whoo, I'm glad I'm not like you. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the epic kind of story of a man's failure, uh, of this leader's failure, who actually took what we're talking about today and went the complete opposite direction in how he handled it. And we're going to see what it says about him. Now, the guy we're talking about is a guy named Rehoboam. Now, Rehoboam is a fascinating individual because he had very famous father, and then he had a very famous grandfather. So his grandfather is a guy named King David, and that's the same David with the, you know, little guy and the giant, you know, fell down. We all know that story. David eventually becomes king, and when he becomes king, he eventually has a son named Solomon. And after David, you know, dies, then Solomon becomes king. And what you find here with this group of people is that they were led by David and Solomon. And you can look at the history of these guys. They both made really big mistakes, and then they both did really incredible things. So Solomon was really almost this genius in terms of wisdom, in terms of military and economic power that he held. Uh, He was a strategist. He was very wealthy. Solomon did a lot of great things. But he also did some things that make you go, I would never want to be led by somebody that way. That even though he was a strong leader and even though he was able to get a lot of things done, he was very oppressive in some ways to uh, some of the people groups that were making these things happen. So if you've ever sat at work and you're like, my boss is making me, and you feel that... Take that, multiply it by about 100, and those are probably some of the feelings that a group of people would have felt under his leadership. Now, Solomon had a son, and again, his son's name is Rehoboam. And as uh, Solomon got older, it became apparent that Rehoboam would be king. And he entered into this kingdom with two things happening, with a lot of economic prosperity going on, with a lot of things that had gotten done, but he also had a whole kind of people group who had experienced this unrest. So there was this very dark side to what had been happening in the kingdom. It was a lot of prosperity in some ways, but then there was a group of people that were upset. And that's where we're going to pick up the narrative, right? You have a a people group who were frustrated and upset. You have a lot of things that had been going on that had been good, a lot of things that had gotten done, a lot of things that had gotten built, economic prosperity. And then you have Rehoboam who enters the scene and in this narrative and has to navigate through how he's going to lead 
from the shadow of his father. And so here's what the narrative says. It says this in 1 Kings chapter 12. It says, the whole assembly, which would have been this whole kind of group of people that were really speaking for all of the people, the whole assembly of Israel, went to Rehoboam and said to him, kind of at the start of some of his leadership, your father, being Solomon, your father put a heavy yoke on us. Your father pushed and pushed and pushed. And even though we did a lot of amazing things, we're tired and we're slightly frustrated and we're a little bit angry, right? He put a heavy yoke on us. But now, talking to Rehoboam, lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke that he put on us. Now watch this. And we will serve you. I love this. Can you imagine if in your company, the key leaders kind of set you down and say, hey, We love you, man. We're going to give you a chance. And what we need you to do is this. And not only will you do this, if you'll do this for us, then we're yours. Now, serving you isn't just an action. In fact, as you look at kind of the Hebrew words that surround this, it's not just we're going to do things for you. It's that you're going to have our heart. Now, think about this for a second. I want you to really think about it. Have you ever worked with a leader who not only got you to do things and not only brought out the best in you and not only got the numbers, but that leader had your heart. That you'd run through a brick wall for them. That not only if they said jump, you'd jump, but you'd be like, how high do you want me to jump? There was a part of you that leaned in and not just wanted to serve them because of their status, but wanted to be on mission with them. This entire people group go, look, you can have all the credibility, all the influence in the world if you'll simply adopt a new style and a new approach to your leadership. And here's what Rehoboam says. He says, Rehoboam answered, go away for three days. Give me three days to think about it and then come back to me. And so the people went away. That's a very wise move that he probably learned from his dad. You'll go away. Give me a little bit of time to process this. Give me a little bit of time to think about it. Let me run this by some people so that I can get some clarity. Because the clarity that he needed is as he looked at his father, there was a lot of this economic prosperity. And a new approach in leadership, even if it meant that it wasn't as oppressive in some ways, might mean that he would have less productivity in the kingdom. That's what he's trying to weigh. And so what he does is he invites some of the wise leaders in, and he consults them, and here's what it says. And King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. Now, I love this. He goes to the people who advised his dad. He goes to people that have walked this journey, seen his father's triumphs, seen his father's struggle, seen his father's weaknesses and strengths, seen the whole deal. And he goes to them and he consults them. He's He's like, look, help me. Give me wisdom. Is this the path? Is this the direction that we should go? He says, how would you advise me to answer these people? What would you say? What would you tell me to do? Now, I'll just tell you this. This is a sidebar, right? Now, leaders, come on, those of you in the room, this is one of the best questions you can ever, ever, ever ask, right? So side, sidebar. If you want to understand your people, and if you want to really get after the heart of the people that you're leading, the question of, hey, if you were me, what would you do? It's one of the best questions you could ever ask. Whether you do it or not, you still got to weigh all of those things. But simply leaning in and saying, if you were me, what would you do? And the further down the organization that you can ask people that question, the better. He is using an enormous amount of wisdom in what he's doing right now. And these are the people that he's decided in this moment would be in his closest circle of relationships and friends. And here's their response. They replied, if today you will be... A servant. If they will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. Or you could say it this way you will always have their heart. The counts is it that if you will, with empathy and humility, come to these people and care for them and hear what they're saying you might actually get more productivity out of them. You might actually do better and bigger things, really, than your father would have done. If you'll come to them with that kind of posture, something may change, and they give him this enormous amount of wisdom. 
Now, this is a moment in the story where you're like, I really hope he takes it. You know, this would be the great part of the story where it's like Rehoboam listened and he goes out and says this, you know, has a whole speech and everybody's like, we love you. And then, you know, they play all this you know, beautiful music behind him. And then he leads the kingdom into, you know, 100 years of prosperity. Everybody's like this. And then they build, you know, pyramids or something. I don't know what they did, right? They do that. But what happens next is so defining for Rehoboam. His next decision is so defining for him and the kingdom. It's one of those moments that if it were in a movie, you're like, oh, no. It's one of those moments that when you're listening, you're like, oh, no, don't do that. Here's what it says. But Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders that they gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. Now, here's the importance of this. What he does is he looks at his inner circle and says, I'm inviting this group of people in it who are giving me this wisdom But there's this other group of people that are in my inner circle that are leading me in a path that maybe I don't need to go on. And there's two groups in it. One is leading him towards wisdom, and one is leading him away from wisdom. And so he invites the young men or the people who uh, were in his inner circle currently, and here's what he says. He asks them, what is your advice? How should we answer the people who say to me, lighten the yoke of your father that he put on us? I love that. Because he invited his father's advisors into the circle to give me wisdom. But he had a group of people who were already in there that were almost acting like a cancer to both his leadership, his life, and the future direction of this group of people. Now, I want you to think about this for a minute in terms of circles, right? So we talked about this earlier. If you think about this in terms of concentric circles, there's this outer core of people, right, who you would probably in this day and age say, yes, we are like friends, right? I have 500 Facebook friends. I have 1,000 Facebook friends. I have, you know, I don't know, 2,000 Instagram followers because you take really great pictures of your kids. That's me. Just kidding. So you do that sort of thing, right? You have all these people that you don't really know. You just do that sort of thing. These are your friends. These are the periphery. Now, those people are important, but they have less impact on your life than the people who kind of go down in this concentric circle. Now, I ask a lot of people and the people that I hang out with, now, like, how would you describe the next group? And I love this. Over the last probably year and a half, there's this phrase that's come out specifically with people that are talking about this next group, and I love it. These are the people that you would say, these are my people. All right, you ever heard this? Like, I'm looking for my people. Like, does your church have, like, my people? Do we go and we hang out with my people? Whatever that means. This is the next core. If your friends are all of your Facebook people that you kind of slightly know and slightly stalk, my people are the friends that you actually have conversations with. These are the people that you text. These are the people that you're in consistent relationship with at some level. And this can be a lot of people. This can be a smaller number of people, depending on your personality type and where you are in life. But these are the my people. Now, these people have a lot more influence than these friends that you don't really talk to much. But the my people group's important. But the one that's most important is at Kensington, what we kind of talk about in terms of this. These are your 2 a.m. friends. These are the people that if you called up at 2 a.m. to say, you know what, I'm struggling with my wife this, our marriage this, she did this, he did this, my finances are this. These are the people who know you to the level to which you could call them at 2 a.m. and they would not be angry, right? These are the people that show up consistently in your life. These are the people that advise you consistently on where you need to go and how you need to live your life and what you need to do. Now, these 2 a.m. friends, I'll miss this, are the people that will, in a lot of ways, influence not only where you end up in life, but what you do in your life. And Rehoboam had a group of people that were already in that 2 a.m. circle, and then he had a group of people that he invited in it. And one of them is giving one advice, set of advice, and the other is giving a completely different set. And what he listens to is going to be extraordinarily important. It says this. Then Rehoboam said this. The young men who had grown up with him replied in this way. These people have said to you, talking about the other groups of people, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now, don't miss this. Now, tell them. Here's the advice that they give him. Now, tell them. My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Now, if you read that and are confused, it's because it's a little bit confusing. (laughs) 
until you understand a little bit of the Hebrew, and I don't want to be crude, right? But this is what they're saying. This is, this is always a euphemism. This is locker room talk. This is a group of guys looking at him and saying this. Yeah, you need to bow up and show them that you're more than your father was. This is a moment in the locker room that you don't really want, you know, your kids to hear, your wife to hear. And this group of guys who are obviously immature, obviously didn't have the best kind of view of the kingdom, obviously didn't have what's best for Rehoboam in mind, go show them that you're more harsh than your dad was. Show them that you're more of a man than he was, that can produce more than he did. They respond with this. My father laid on you a heavy yoke, and I will make it even heavier. Sounds like a boy trying to bow out his chest and grasp at something that wasn't his anyway, demanding a kind of leadership that wasn't his. My father scourged you with whips, but I will scourge you with scorpions. The imagery is violent. And he listens to that core group of friends, those 2 a.m. friends, who are leading him in a path away from God's will. I think about this for a second. When you think about it from thousands of years ago, and a guy who's trying to prove that he's man enough and that he can lead the kingdom with his father seems a little bit distant. Until you, like, put it in our concept today, right? Every guy in this room at some point has listened to another group of guys that said, hey, if you're not man enough unless you, or if you really want to get this, then you'll do this. Every woman in the room, right, has experienced a moment where there's been a group of other women that said, if you could do this, and this is how it should be, and they're going down a path, and you're like, wow. I want the things that they're getting. I don't know that I agree with how they're getting them, but I want those things. If to get those things, I have to compromise, and I will follow there. And some of your greatest regret lives in that world. You look at Rehoboam, you're going, yeah, I would never, I shouldn't, or that sort of thing. What's happening with him is something that happens to us all the time. Rehoboam's inner circle would ultimately shape his life. I want you to think about this. Rehoboam's inner circle would ultimately shape his life and the life of the kingdom. Which means that your inner circle should be one of the things that you are most actively protecting in your life. And that if you ignore it, if you ignore your inner circle, the consequences to the advice that you're giving the influence people have in your life could be detrimental to the things that you want to achieve, to your family, to your kids, to your legacy. And it's so easy for us to do that. And this happens every day. It means that if you're around a group of people who consistently gossip, like, come on, and they're in your inner circle, the likelihood of you being a gossip is much higher and you'll be more and more desensitized to it. Fellas, If the group of guys are in your 2 a.m. circle are looking at porn, the likelihood that you will one day look at pornography just skyrockets. If the people that are in your inner circle are doing things that you don't want to end up in life doing, come on, come on. And you got to remove them from your inner circle. You got to distance yourself from the relationship. Because that will really more than almost anything else in your life, dictate where you go. Now, this is easy to teach to our kids. This is easy to teach to other people. This is easy to spot in other people, but it's difficult for us to apply. But I want you to look at the consequences of what Rehoboam had to go through. Here's what the writer says. When all Israel saw that the king refused to listen to them, they answered the king, What share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? They're referencing the line and the influence they had. It says, to your tents, Israel, look after your own house, David, or saying this, we are alone. Not only are you not going to serve us, not only do you not have our heart, but we feel alone in this. And they are empowered to make a 
a set of decisions. And the consequences to this passage are so beautifully written because they're written with this word that kind of starts off the consequences and it says this. So, since you've made those decisions, there's a so. Since you decided to neglect the principle, there's a so. Since you decided to listen to the wrong group of people in your inner circle, there is a so and there's a consequence that follows that and it will be painful for you, it will be painful for the kingdom, and it will be painful for all the people in your circle of influence. It says this. So the Israelites went home. So they walked away. They said, nope, we're not following you. And the assumption at times is that it'll be a temporary thing. The problem is that's simply not true in a lot of the things that we do. And some of the decisions that we make because of the advice that we get from our inner circle lead us to a place where it will be a permanent part of our story. In fact, the decisions that you're making today, decisions you're going to make tomorrow, the decisions that you've made in your past, though you can be forgiven for them, will become a part of your story. And the beautiful part about Jesus is that you can redeem all things, but at the end of the day, the wake of your decision-making will still be there. There is grace, there is forgiveness, and there is redemption, but it is not erased from your story. That the temporary things that sometimes we assume will just be temporary and go away become a rest of his life sort of thing. The writer chronicles it this way and says this, So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Rehoboam's inner circle would shape his life and the life of the kingdom. So my question for you is who are your 2 a.m. friends? Who are those people that are shaping your life? Who are those people that you have allowed into your life and what did their lives look like? Because come on, if the people that are closest to you and that are speaking into your life are living their lives in a different direction, if they're doing things that you should not be doing, I'm telling you, all you're doing is making yourself vulnerable to a story that you don't want to tell. So what I want you to do as we kick off this series And we're going to talk about all kinds of relationships with this series. But what I want you to do is I want you to think about your 2 a.m. friends. And I'm going to give you three principles in terms of how to evaluate who are those people that are in that closest inner circle kind of 2 a.m. relationship. Now, here's the first principle, and that's this. The close proximity to wise people puts you in close proximity to a life of wisdom. I don't miss this. Some of you, this is where you pull out your phone and you start taking pictures. This is the stuff that I want you to remember, right? Close proximity to wise people puts you in close proximity to a life of wisdom. If you talk to wise people, and I don't miss this, it's not that they're super smart, even though they may be smart. It's that they have surrounded themselves with people who are wise. Wisdom is contagious. I don't know why, but it just is. When you surround yourself with wise people, it's, it's, it's more likely that that will be transferable to you. You are, position, you are actively positioning yourself to live a better life when you are in close proximity to wise people. One of the best things that you could do is this. Can I take you to lunch? I'll buy it. It's seven extra dollars for you if you go to Wendy's. I'm, not, I'm just saying it's seven dollars at Wendy's. Not that I've ever been there. But you can go and you can sit somebody down and you say, I just want to talk to you about. Now, somebody told me this when I was in uh, high school. I think it was in high school. Yeah, well, youth pastor did. Yeah, his name was Jay. Jay told me this principle when I was in high school. And here's what he told me. He said, at every season of your life, there are going to be things that evolve and are important, and they're going to be beyond your ability to know what to do. And he says, not every person is wise about everything, and he's, he's absolutely right. But you need to identify what those areas of your life are that you need to navigate through, and you need to find the wisest person that you can find and sit them down consistently and say, pour into me and tell me what you know right? I have somebody I do this when it comes to finances. I have somebody I do this when it comes to marriage. I have a different person that I do this when it comes to to being a dad of a one-year-old. And then when he becomes three years old, I have a different person that I'm going to start asking then, right? Because I'm looking for the wisest people to be in my inner circle, right? So that I can be wise in that. And when it comes to leadership, pastor, that sort of thing, all that sort of thing, I have somebody that I go to that is wise, and it's not, no, miss this. It's not that I, I, I learn all of this, you know, I do, but it's not that I have all of these like catchphrases that I pick up on because catchphrases are just catchphrases, right? 
is that there's something powerful and even spiritual about being in close proximity to wise people. And you got to figure out how to do that in your life. Second principle is this. Andy Stanley says this. I wish I would have written this, but he wrote this. Friends who are careless with their lives will be careless with yours. That's just true. Friends who are careless with their lives will be careless with your life. Now, I want you to think about this for a second. That means the people in your life that are making the worst kind of decisions, this is the hard part and the painful part. They don't need to be here. They need to be here or more likely here. Now, that doesn't mean you don't ever spend time with them because you need to spend time with people. We're called to, you know, really be in a relationship with all sorts of people. But they don't need to be here because if they're here, you're going to move in that direction. You need to figure out how do I spend less time with and move them out here. Now, you do this with your kids anyway. Now, come on. Here's how I know this, that you do this. You look at your kids, and you're like, you can spend the night at their house, but you can't spend the night at their house. Don't you do that. You look at your kids and like, you know what? I'll let you spend more time with this person, but they can only hang out with us if I'm in the room. And at some point as an adult, we're like, well, we we don't really do that anymore because I'm mature enough. You're not mature enough. You're not. No one in this room is. You've got to figure out how you remove people from here to here and create the necessary distance so they're not influencing you in a negative way. Because if they're careless with their life, I promise you, they're going to be careless with yours. And the third principle is this, that the courage to adjust your inner circle will protect you. Now, this is the part that I hope messes you up and will protect others. For those of you who are dads in the room, now, come on, you have such responsibility. You do. You have such responsibility. And if you're careless with your life, you're not just making a decision for you. You're making a decision with your wife and your kids and their kids, and the story that's going to be told, and the kind of baggage that they're going to carry. Like, come on, come on. And God can redeem every bit of it. He can. But why would you ever make yourself vulnerable in those kinds of ways? Fellas, I'm telling you, those of you who are engaged with friends and, you know, that you know they're looking at stuff that you shouldn't be, you should feel like the outlier, and then you should do something about it. Now, I'm going to talk to ladies just for a second in the room. And I I know I don't have, I have less speaking rights for the ladies because obviously I don't know that much about women. But here's what I want to tell you, right? I want to tell you this. And this is for those of you who are married, want to be married, interested in marriage, whatever that is, relationships, the whole deal. I want to tell you one thing. Now, this is just observation. It's just me. Some of you have surrounded yourself with other women or other wives or other women who live a life where they talk bad about their spouse or their husband. Or their, and I could pick on a lot of things, but I just want to talk about this one. And that, that's the people that you hang out with. Now, you don't even know it, but what you, you kind of subtly do is you've started doing the same thing to your husband. And it's like this slow thing, and you don't even know it, but you've, it's like these little jabs constantly, and it hurts. And you feel distance in the relationship. And no, no I'm going to tell you, come on. And it's because... You surround yourself, you didn't even know you are doing it. You surround yourself with people that were gossips, or you surround yourself with people that were just, just did this. And it's been cutting. Some of you need to say, you know what? It's not even that you're a bad person. You're just doing marriage differently than I want to do marriage. I'm going to do that. You know why? Because for men, and I don't know why, but all the studies that I've read about it say that men need to feel respected, you know? And that your words just have a way of doing that. The way that you approach them just have a way of doing that. This is one of a thousand areas that we could talk about, but this is the easiest one for me to kind of look at today. Surround yourself with the kind of women who are making you the woman that you want to be, the wife that you want to be, the spouse that you want to be, and the mom you want to be. Fellas, the exact same thing is true for you. Surround yourself with men that open the door for their wives. Surround yourself with men who are selfless for their family. Surround yourself with men who know they don't have it all together and aren't pretending. And if you'll do that, I'm telling you, your marriage will be different. But it causes you, and I don't miss this, to take an intentional step to distance yourself from some relationships and to move other people in to the closest. I want to say these two things and we'll wrap up. But that is very difficult, but it's necessary. There are a lot of people who choose not to do this. I'm telling you, you face the consequences. It's difficult, but it's necessary. And it's always emotional. Even if you're not an emotional person, it's always emotional, but it is essential. Now, I'll tell you this, and this does not mean that you sit down 
and you look at them and like, I'm moving you from a 2 a.m. friend to a my people. Just, they're going to look at you and be like, you're paying for lunch. You know, like that's, that's not going to be good for you. So I'm going to tell you the boundaries for me, right? This is how I do it. And I do this all the time. I really do. I, we try to make, in our house, we talk about this. My wife and I talk like, who are your friends? Who are close to you? How are they leading you? you know? <laughs> what I do is I do distance myself relationally. I stop hanging out as much time or I invite more people in and we do things in groups. You're like, that's such a high school thing. It is because it freaking works. <laughs> right? So I'm just saying this, right? I'm saying this. Surround yourself with people in groups because you're probably not talking about your greatest sin in a group, you know? You're probably not doing that. Now, some of you are in a small group. Now, this is where it gets really messy. Craig's going to kill me. <laughs> some of you are in a small group right now, and this stuff is happening, and the first step that you need to do is say, we need to be a different group of people. We need to navigate this differently. Second step that you need to do is if you need to remove yourself from the group or pull some people out and go to a different, you need to do that. And let them find another group. And you're like, oh, that's messy. It is messy, but it's necessary. You need to be in life with people, but you need to know where they are in your life. So I think setting the boundaries, doing things in groups is an important thing. The other thing that I do is this. I know this is difficult and uh, very hard to do. I, I limit the amount of time and the times that I communicate with certain people, right? So there are a group of people that can text me after 10 o'clock at night, right? A group of people can text me after midnight. You know, there, there are those groups of people. But there's a lot of people that don't. Because I'm not going to enter in those conversations at that time. Because we need to create distance in those relationships. Those are a couple of ways. There's a lot of other ways you can do it. I would say this. Most of the ways that you would parent your kids is the way that you need to navigate your own heart and how you protect your 2 a.m. friends. Now, the last thing I want to tell you, and then we're going to end, is this. I want you to know this. That your future is most shaped by those that are closest to you. If you want to know where you're ending up, and if you want to know the direction that your life is going, you got to know this. Your future is most shaped by the people that you surround yourself with. you got to choose so wisely. So what I want to do is I'm going to give you a story of a guy who kind of embraced this principle and really navigated this personally. Try to figure out, like, how does this work for him? His name is Chase. He actually, through his story, you're going to see how he kind of removed certain people from out and then put certain people in, and how that group of people ultimately was a small group for him that led him into the place that he needed to be. Let's watch Chase's story together. My friends and I We've been together since we were in kindergarten. Some of my earliest memories as a, as a child are with these guys that I grew up with. Um, and so we um, were just kind of inseparable from a, from a very early age and up into high school and then our first three years of college, like we were always together. My freshman year of college, uh, my parents got a divorce. It was messy. It wasn't, it was really hard, um, not just on me and my family, um, but on our community as well. I didn't really know where to turn, and um, my friends were there. I really started to see them more as a family um, than just friends. And that kind of took a turn for all of us when we got into our freshman year of college. Um, and that's when, you know, we all kind of got shown the party scene, I guess. Um, we all started drinking. Um, some of us started doing drugs. I can sit back even then, and I knew what I was doing was wrong. Um, but I didn't care, and they didn't care. Right before I graduated college, I met my fiance, um, and she brought me to Kensington. There was a part of me that was like, you know what, maybe I will try church again. Uh, maybe, I, maybe this is the time that I start doing good things again. I, I felt like I could kind of still live my life the way that I was doing it um, and go to church on the weekends and be okay. And I could still have my friends and we could still hang out and everything would be good. But there was still, I, I can't explain it. There was just still something missing. There was something internally that I wasn't, that there was a hole and I couldn't fill it. And that's when I, I kind of took notice and I would say, um, I really started seeking after God. I went camping by myself up north with the one goal of finding God. I definitely think that 
you know, God spoke to me up there and said that, um, that I'm opening these doors for you right now to meet new people, to kind of transition your life, and you're not walking through them, and I need you to. When I came home and I talked to Erica, she said, I, I definitely think that you should go to Man Up. It's a men's retreat um, that, that's going on in October. I, I was like, yeah, you know, that, that could be great, but I don't know anyone. Like, there's, there's no one there that I'm connected with right now. I'm not in a small group. I don't know anyone really at Kensington, any guys at Kensington that I could, you know, connect with or do life with. And um, so it was kind of, it's kind of scary for me. I went knowing my intentions. I went knowing that I'm close. Like, I, I'm i very close to, like, giving God my all. And I just didn't know what was stopping me. I think it was Sunday morning, Dave Wilson spoke, and it shook me. And I knew that morning that I needed to talk to someone. That's when Drew Daniels, guy I just met maybe a week ago, um, came up and sat down next to me and just started talking to me about the weekend. And Drew's like, dude, like what's going on? Like, I feel like you're close. I feel like you're, you're, you're ready to have a relationship with Jesus. Like what's holding you back. And that's when I was just, I, I was like, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Um, but it's, it's something and I need to get rid of it. And so he, he was like, you want to pray? And I was like, yeah. Um, so he, he starts praying for me and then, um, and he's like, okay, like you pray. Like I don't pray out loud to, to people, you know, like I pray in my head. And, um, but I did. And I said, Jesus, like, I'm done. Like I'm done running from you. I'm, I want to experience the freedom that I know that you're going to give me. The week after I came back from Man Up, um, I called each and every one of the guys and had a separate conversation with them saying, you know, Hey, I just wanted you to know that um, I gave my life to Christ, and I'm going to pursue my life to, or I'm going to change my life to follow Him. And um, I, I just, I felt like you guys needed to know that. And I still love you guys, and I'm still going to see you, and I want to, you know, hang out with you. But I'm, I'm a different person now. Through Drew, I, I met some other guys, and through those guys, I got hooked up into a small group, and. I was there every week, and I loved it. I just want to know Jesus more. I want to learn as much as I can. And that's what, you know, this group did. You know, it was, we were able to, I was able to learn not just, you know, about the Bible. I can, I can study the Bible by myself. But I was able to talk through real-life situations that these guys were going through, that I was going through. You know, I, I don't think that I would be as far as I am right now which I still got a long way to go. We always do. If I hadn't found this community of, of new guys, of people that love Christ, um, that, you know, I can still have fun with, that I can hang out with, that are going to be um, just not only friends, but family again. Friendship now, it, it takes a whole different, it's a whole different perspective for me. The fact that I have a group of people that, I know genuinely love me, that I know would um, do anything to help me, but also are going to teach me along the way, that they're going to um, hold me accountable for my actions, that they're going to be honest with me through love. I, I don't know where my life would be if I didn't take that step to go to Man Up, that I didn't take that step to just talk to someone. Um, to join a small group, to um, you know, be vulnerable with these guys and take a chance. And, and if I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. There's so much that has happened because I have found community and that I have found these amazing group of guys that um, I can't imagine not doing life with. Chase has this line at the end that I thought was so powerful. He said, this. He said, I don't know where my life would be if it weren't for this group of guys. And then he kind of talks about how he could have really imagined what all would have happened since he made the decision to pay, not only pay attention to who his closest friends were, but to take a step towards 
kind of relationships that he needed to take. So here's what I want to do just to kind of wrap up our time, because this hits all of us in different ways. Some of you even listen to this message and you look back and you look like it now and you look at your past and you feel just a weight towards like, oh, I've made, I've made bad decisions. I've continually made bad decisions. I feel like I'm making bad decisions right now. And to be honest, if I'm going to fast forward this next week, I'll probably continue to make bad decisions this week. You know, that's just you. That's where you are right now. And you're like, that's, that's currently what's going on. And that could be all sorts of different things, but you know what that is. And the truth of the gospel is that God does redeem our brokenness. And that Jesus came and he, he does something miraculous that if you're, you know, if you're not a follower of Jesus, you're like, I don't, I don't know that I agree or fully understand it. I'm like, I get it. You almost have to experience it. But the people that have turned to follow Jesus turned in a different direction and said, I'm going I'm to trust you with my life. I'm going to follow you. All of a sudden they begin to experience life that's different. And, and God does redeem these things in a huge way. But here's the, the thing about the gospel is God never intended you to have the regret that you've had in your past because of your sin. And God's intentions for you for the future isn't that you continue on in a path that's going to lead you to that regret. And so for you, and you know, the writers in the New Testament talk about this. Jesus had his own inner circle, and you kind of look at how he kind of structured his relationships in the New Testament. The truth of the gospel is that God does redeem all of that, but you don't have to experience the regret that you've experienced in the past. And some of you, you look at your past, you're like, I don't like that story, but today is the day that you get to say, I'm going to write a new story for my future by choosing to follow Jesus and not just follow Jesus with a prayer and not just follow Jesus in the words that I say, but I'm gonna follow Jesus in an action step towards the relationship that he's calling me, the relationships that he's calling me to be a part of. So that's, that's one set of you. There's another set of you that you're like, you know what, if you were honest, you've been burned by people before, you've had relationships that didn't go well, and you're just the person who's created walls for other people that you just, you know what, I mean, I'll be vulnerable enough, but I'm not gonna really be vulnerable. Some of you are in a small group right now and you have never opened up that you've said just enough, but you have never opened up for real. And my question to you is, when are you going to start allowing other people in your life to be those 2 a.m. friends for you? When are you going to do that? And then there's a group of people that I want to kind of wrap up with, and this is we're going to end, is you are busy. You've got a lot going on. You've got toddlers. You've got kids. You've got teenagers. You, you feel like you're minivanning people all over the place. You're working so much. And you have never prioritized community in your life. It's not even that you have an enormous amount of regret. It's not that you're doing things necessarily that aren't great. But you've just never taken an action step towards 2 a.m. friends or the kind of people in a small group. You just don't do that. And you've got all sorts of excuses. And I get that you've got all sorts of excuses. We got a toddler and we did a church merger in the last year. And we, you know, I get it. There's not a small group night that I'm just not looking at Emily like, we don't have it. We don't have an excuse. We don't have an excuse. We're going, you know, and I love the people that we're in small group with, but I'm the most introverted individual that you've ever met. And that's tough. But I want to say this. Some of you need to do small group out of a discipline first and develop those relationships. Some of you need to acknowledge that though you're busy, you're not as busy as you say you are. You can make time for the things that are most important. So it's time that you made time for the things that are most important. And you need to jump into a small group. So throughout this series, we're going to talk about how to do that. But today, there's a very easy way to do it. You can Talk to anybody in the lobby. We've got an info station. Craig's going to be out there. Craig, you'll see Craig. He'll be doing all sorts of things. Some of you need to take a step towards small group. We have an event coming up in October. It's a very easy way for you to jump into that. But I'm just telling you this. If you've never gotten in a small group, if you're not currently in a small group, even if you're not a follower of Jesus, that is one of the most important things that you can do to surround yourself with an inner circle of people who are pushing you in the direction that you want to go because your future is going to be most shaped by those that are closest to you how to choose those people wisely and you got to actively take steps so i'm going to pray for us uh, the band's going to come out we're going to sing a song to wrap up our time the song that we're going to sing is called glory to glory and the simple truth of this song that i want for us as a church to really sing out kind of as a prayer is that we're never going to be the same there's going to be a catalytic moment in all of our lives for some of you that's today others of you you may you may fast forward, but I, I just believe that there's going to be a point in life where you almost feel forced to. So you can choose to do it now or you can choose to do it when you feel forced to. But there's going to be a point where most of us bend towards community. But what we're praying today as a church is that we'll never be the same and that we'll trust God to move us towards the changes that he has in our lives. And for a lot of us today, that's taking a step towards groups. So let me pray for us and then we'll wrap up. Father, we thank you for this truth. God, we thank you for capturing these stories about people who did it well, people who didn't do it well. Uh, God, 
Thank you for Solomon and Rehoboam and David's story that we can look at. So, Father, I just ask that for the person in here where they've looked at their past or they look at their present or if they fast forward in their future, they know exactly where they're headed. God, I pray today in these moments that you would break them in a good way, that you would break their hearts, that in, in some way you would flood them with a kind of emotion that's needed in this moment for them to take a catalytic next step towards you or to take a next step towards community. God, I pray for the people in here that are just so busy and they've just never made time for small groups. They've just never done it. God, I pray that today you would give them the courage to protect their lives by surrounding themselves with people who are gonna lead them in the direction they need to go. And then I pray for the people who are kind of just like me, where it's difficult to be vulnerable in group. It's difficult to sometimes even go to group, you know, whatever those things are. I pray that they would always lean And if the moment that they feel it, or if they don't feel it, they would lean in, if nothing else, to protect their lives and the lives that are in their circles of influence with family and friends, kids, grandkids, and their legacy. They would lean in with all their heart, protect that innermost circle of people. And they would be a part of a community that's helping them to be who you've called them. I ask you to stand up and we're going to sing this together.
that this morning. Declare it again. you know exactly the next step that you need to take. And here's what I promise you. If you wait till the end of your lunch, you probably won't take it. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Before you eat lunch, you need to take a step towards small groups. Those of you who need to take that step. You can do it at KennedyChurch.org. Uh, you can do it there. I would say for a, a bunch of you, you just need to go do it in the lobby before you leave. If those of you, you know, you need to grab your husbands. Go, we're going to go do this. So you need to grab your wives. We're going to go do this. Some of you need to grab your boyfriend says, you're going to be a different small group, but we're going to go do this, whatever that is, right? You need to go do that today and take that next step before you eat lunch. That's my challenge to you. Thank you so much for being here. Next week, we continue our series called Circles, and we'll see you right back here at 9 or 11. Thanks so much for being with us. See you next Sunday. Thank you so much for watching online. We know that so many of you watch week in and week out. We just want to say thanks so much. Thanks for following us. Thanks for commenting. Thanks for sharing this content. Really, your part of getting this message all over the world. So we just want to say thanks so much for doing that. Uh, and a lot of you, you might be uh, kind of in a city here in Traverse City. You might be in Metro Detroit area or even Orlando. And you want to take a next step towards small groups. You can do that right online at Kensington Church. Dot org. You can find all the information that you need to be a part of a group there. And then, as we said earlier in our service, we are very passionate about what's happening in Texas and being a part of the redemption and the restoration of that city in Houston. Uh, and so we'd love for you to partner with us in, in giving online. Again, you can do that, gettingchurch.org. You can do that on the app. You're going to find a, an area there where you just click on Hurricane Harvey. You can give to those places and, and be a part of what's going on there. Again, thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you right back here next week.
Hey everybody, my name is Patrick, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for watching online today. You are part of a growing community of people who are liking and sharing this content with people really all over the world, and we just wanted to say thank you so much for partnering with us to get the message out. Thanks for following us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, today we're kicking off a brand new series called Circles, and over the next three weeks, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be looking at your relationships, how you manage your relationships, figuring out who should be in your innermost circle and how you make those kinds of decisions. And ultimately, we're even gonna be talking about small groups in this series as well. We're so excited about today. We're gonna to have a lot of fun up front. I promise you're gonna enjoy it, even from the comfort of your own home or a coffee shop, from wherever you're watching today. Thanks so much for watching. And we promise you're gonna have a good time. We'll see you in a few minutes. All right, so I did this uh, in the first service, but I want to introduce you real quick. Everybody say, hey, Ben Swan. Now, Ben Swan is a part of a traveling duo, not three people, duo here in Traverse City. They travel all around. In fact, you may have seen them here in Traverse City, and he's also one of our worship leaders. And didn't he do an awesome job on that? Wasn't that so good? Yeah. I also don't like being in the same camera shot with him because he's a stud muffin. So I'm just saying, like, he's a good-looking guy. 
We'll talk about that later. Anyway, hey, welcome. My name is Patrick, and we are so glad that you're here. Uh, and if this is your very first time, we just wanted to say welcome uh, to Kensington Church, and we hope you're having a great Labor Day weekend so far. Um, today, we are actually kicking off a brand new series called Circles that we'll be telling you about here uh, in just a few minutes. But before we jump into the day, I wanted to give you just a couple of announcements that are going on here at our church. So if you would, when you came in, I think you were given a program when you came in. I'd love for you to go ahead and pull that out. Uh, I just wanted to highlight just a couple of things that are happening here at our church and let you know what's going on. Uh, The first of which uh, is an event that we have coming up soon called Man Up. And this one is for all of the fellas in the room. Uh, How many of you, did anybody go to Man Up last year? We had a couple of people that went last year. Yeah, pretty great. Yeah, yeah, you did. I remember. Yeah, it was fun. So Man Up is an amazing, amazing event. Uh, And what we do for the whole weekend is just man stuff. Now, I'm not even for sure what all of that means, but it's so much fun. Uh, And I'll tell you this, a lot of you, if you've never been on a retreat like this, uh, it's such an incredible uh, thing to be able just to get with a group of guys for a weekend um, and then just really experience a weekend like this together. So what happens is we go as a church, uh, but there's about 800 to 1,000 guys that end up coming uh, to this. And we go to Spring Hill Camp. There's all sorts of fun things to do. Uh, Wives, there's all sorts of fun ways your husband can get hurt. And so it's so much fun for you as well. Um, So we have prayer meetings here at the church. I'm just kidding. Anyway, it's so much fun. And uh, and you get to eat. You get to do all kinds of things together. But I would tell, tell you this. If you've never been to a retreat like this, if you've never been to a men's weekend, um, I would say I would love for you to give it a shot. I, I promise you that you would enjoy it. I promise that you're going to like it. And if you don't like it, let us know. We'll refund all your money, I promise. So you'll get to go to the weekend. If you don't like it, we'll just give you your money back. We will. And so we'd love for you just to try it once. The, the dates for this are going to be October 6th through the 8th. We're going to be going to Spring Hill Camp again, and, uh, and it's going to be a great weekend. So you can sign up at kensingtonchurch.org, or you can sign up in the lobby as well, get all the information that you need uh, there. The second thing I want to let you know about is that we have a vision night for our uh, family ministries volunteers coming up this week. So September 6th is we're going to be having this. Do we have any uh, K-Kids volunteers or student ministry volunteers out there? Anybody out there? Yeah. Most of you guys are pretty loud and a little bit rowdy. That's fun. So, yeah, you are. So, uh, so it's fun. We'd love you to be a part of this. Um, and that's actually why I'm wearing this shirt. And so we actually uh, are going to be giving some of these shirts out uh, at this uh, volunteer night. We also have a chef that is coming in just to cater the meal for you. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to invite you, if you're a current volunteer, or if you're somebody who's like on the fringe and you're interested and you're thinking about K-Kids or student ministry, we would love for you to be a part of this as well. This is going to be a great opportunity for you just to hear about what's going on, but also to get free food. So you just, you don't really have a lot of excuses. You get to show up for free, really good food uh, and be a part of that. But we'd love for you just to learn a little bit more about our ministries and what we do. Uh, And you might even win a free t-shirt like this. So now we'd love for you to be a part uh, of that. And then the third thing that I want to let you know about is our leadership gathering. Um, uh, twice a year, what we do is we gather all of the, the leaders at Kensington, uh, volunteer leaders, staff teams, everybody. Uh, we go downstate and uh, we actually experience a, a night of just vision, hearing from our founders. We actually have brought in two uh, pretty big speakers that are going to be coming, talking about leadership development and where we're going as a church. And so if you're someone who's interested in learning more about the direction of Kensington and where we're headed, or if you're interested in just learning more about us, this is a great opportunity for you to do that. Uh, we're going to be doing it at our Orient campus downstate. So you can sign up online, kensingtonchurch.org slash lead to get more information uh, or to be a part of that. So uh, with that, I want to go ahead and invite our ushers to move forward. We're going to go ahead and receive our offering. I want to tell you two things. Uh, first, thank you so much to all of you who give. Uh, we really couldn't do anything that we do here or abroad without you just partnering with us in, in a giving way. So we just wanted to say thank you so much uh, for doing that. The second thing that we wanted to let you know about uh, is a bunch of you have been asking over the last week and a half uh, about like how our church is engaging with what's going on in Houston. So I feel like you'd probably have to be under a rock to not know that there was a hurricane that passed through Texas and really uh, specifically hit Houston hard. And so uh, as a church, we actually have several connections with people there that are serving on the ground and are a part of really bringing the restoration back to Houston, volunteering there, serving there. Um, we actually have a, one of our staff members' wives that's looking to go down there and actually just volunteer and be a part of that as well, which is pretty amazing. Uh, but here's what I would love just to tell you is uh, when it comes to giving, you could give to a lot of different organizations. I mean, there's a, a ton of organizations that are uh, gathering funds and distributing those funds. But uh, what we're doing is we're gathering funds and we're specifically uh, investing in two churches that are locally on the ground 
in Houston. And so one of those churches is actually from a person that was a part of Kensington years ago. Uh, he has a church now in Houston, and they are a part of just kind of sending out their church uh, to do whatever they can in the community. And so what we're doing is uh, we are raising funds here uh, at Kensington. But again, all of that, 100% of that, is getting distributed back uh, to those two churches in Houston. And so I wanted to give you just a prompt on how you can be a part of that giving if you choose to be. And so you can look right up here. Uh, there's two specific ways that we can ask you, that we would ask you to give. Uh, the first one is you can give straight on our Kensington app. Uh, a lot of you give that way anyway. In fact, the vast majority of you who give to Kensington give on the app or give online. And so this is an easy way to do that. You just go to the Kensington app. You just find the Hurricane Harvey Relief. You click that button and it'll prompt you through that. It'll be less than 10 seconds for you to engage that quickly through what we're doing. Or uh, you can send a text message. And so you can go uh, and to text the number 77977. Again, that's 77977. Simply just type in the word Kensington, send it on, and you'll get a prompt back that'll tell you how you can give through text message. You just kind of type in the dollar amount, it goes, and, uh, and it's a super easy way to get involved in that as well. Again, there's a lot of places that you could give, but if you're looking to give to the local church and to resource the local churches in Houston, uh, this is a great way to do that. So we'd love to partner with you in that way or invite you to join us in that. So again, we're uh, kicking off a brand new series today called Circles. What we're going to be doing over the next three weeks is talking about your friendships, your relationships, even a little bit of your dating relationships and spouses, the whole deal. And so we're so excited about this series, but we wanted to kind of get into it and ease into this series. And so we're going to have a little bit of fun up top. Are you guys up for having a little bit of fun? Are you guys, I hear the 11 o'clock crowd is the rowdy crowd. Is that right? Are you guys a little bit, especially this section, are you guys the rowdy section? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you are. Like, pass me another cup of coffee. Anyway, you're excited, right? It's going to be a lot of fun. We'd love for you just to engage with us. Even if you're like, I'm a little bit uncomfortable. Can we do this in church? Yes, we're going to. So it'll be a lot of fun. We'd love for you to join us in this. It's going to be great. So before we jump into that, I'd love you to go ahead and stand up. You have three or four people around you, a high five, and ask them this question. Where is the best place in Traverse City to get a cheeseburger? Ask them that question. Where is the best place? Well, hey, good morning, everybody. Uh, and no matter what side you're on, it's a good day because both Michigan and Michigan State won yesterday, so we can all be happy, right? Uh, hey, I'm going to invite two of my friends up here, Micah and Meredith. They're going to work their way up here. Uh, these are two of my good, good friends, and um, I like a little bit of spirited competition. So uh, Micah and Meredith are coming up here. They're a part of my uh, um, small group with a bunch of other young adults here. If you're a young adult and you want to get connected, come see us. Uh, but we're going to play a little game today. And since we're talking about friendships and the people that we surround ourselves with, we're going to play a little game of who's that best friend. And so what's going to happen is there's going to be a person on the screen, and these two, once they realize who the person is, are going to hit this button. It never works, dang it. Oh, it's there now, since that was easy. Uh, they'll hit this button, and then they will quickly say the name of the person that's the best friend with the person on the screen. Here's where you come in. <laughs> this is very, very nervous. Uh, Michael lives in Elk Rapids, so he's going to represent uh, the west side, right? No, east side. East, I'm like, oh, directionally. He's going to represent west of uh, 31 in division. Meredith lives over off 72. I shouldn't tell you where these people live. Uh, my bad. Uh, but she's going to represent the west side. So you guys have some rooting interest here. Uh, if you know the answer, help your team out. Yell it out. Let them know. Because whoever hits this button first and says the right answer gets a point. And now, we should be good at this. I think we're going to be good. I feel confident in these two. Are you guys ready to play? No, they're not. It looks like you guys are on your own. They're not ready to play. All right, there's a few. All right, let's see the first one. You might want to get your hands closed because the first one's going to be up there. You can look right from that back screen. Ready for it? Darn it. <laughs> nope. Okay, that's a uh, nope. Do you know? Ken. Ken! Wow, Micah! Uh, I was thinking of a little girl. Should we be alarmed that he got that? He's got nieces. It's okay. All right. Uh, so one point for Micah. Ooh. Robin. Robin. Batman and Robin. We all know that. <laughs> Is that Chris O'Donnell? Actually, really. Okay. Here we go. Uh, one to one. Let's see the next one. Chewy. Chewy, he says. Fun fact. I've never seen a Star Wars movie, so I could not have got that. 
I probably just lost some credibility with some people. It's okay. Um, next up, we got two to one. Ernie. Ernie. Bert. Is it Ernie or Bert? Doesn't matter. You got both of them. Bert and Ernie, two best friends there. I wouldn't have got that. My childhood was deprived. And no Star Wars. Don't know who these guys are. Uh, how about this next one? Chandler. Chandler. There's someone in the back. I see them going, hit it. It's Chandler. Hit it. <laughs> Getting very violent. <laughs> All right. So is that two? I'm not even keeping good track. Is that two to two? She's like, I'm winning. <laughs> wow. All right. We're going to, uh, okay. We got a technicality. It's right in the middle. I promise. All right. We're going to say it's two to two because I lost track. Let's see the next one. Come on. It's Lloyd Christmas. Larry? Larry? <laughs> you're, you're in the ballpark, I guess. Harry! Harry! Is it Harry? It is Harry Lloyd Christmas, Dumb and Dumber. I think that puts you up three to two. Let's see this next one. Patrick. Patrick! Never <laughs> You've never seen SpongeBob? Oh my goodness, I think that's a draw. So we're even. All right, pick a number between one and 100. 53. 53? 23. It was 55. It's always 55. Uh, Meredith wins today. She's going to get herself a Moomers gift card. Our champion. Give it a round. Thank you, Mike Asari. You let down everyone east of US 31. So carry that with you today. Uh, but here's the deal. Uh, we are going to continue on with today, and we're going to continue on, and I'm going to need your help. Here's what I need you to do. I need everyone to stand up. Because one thing that good friends do is good friends sing together. And so our band is going to lead us through a couple of songs. And Carrie right now, she's going to take us to church with the song we all know. Are you ready, Carrie? She's ready. So I want you guys to sing along with her, and we're going to have some fun this morning. Get the hands going. Come on. You can do better. There you go. Church. Ain't no river wide enough to keep me from getting to you, baby. All right, all right. Hey, give yourselves a round of applause. That was good. Uh, we're going to do a couple more. This one I feel like it's going to hit some, some maybe early 20s, 30s, because this song, it moves me. Some of you maybe had this for your wedding song. Ryan, channel your inner boy brand. You are Come on. Come on. My oh, there, there's enough people that know it. people in here who had no idea when they left their house this morning they'd be singing Backstreet Boys but it's okay uh, this next one please don't stand on your chair please don't stand on your chair we're gonna try to keep this one mild but everybody knows it let's get a sway going let's get a sway where it began I can't begin to knowing but then I know it's growing strong. You're feeling it. Was in the spring. It's happening. Then spring Just became it. the summer. 
Who'd have believed you? All right, here's your chance to get the hands out. Get them out. Put the coffee down. Get the hands up. There we go. Touching hands. The nine o'clock got him way up. Reaching out. Touching me. Touching. Here we go, everyone. Nice. You're doing it. One more, one more. Let's do one more. This one, the greatest TV show of all time. You know it. The person next to you knows it. Let's nail it. Oh! Alright, everyone together. sounded great. Isn't it so much fun to be able to sing songs we all kind of grew up with or know together, man, in community. That's when I experience some of the most awesome times in my life is when we're doing things together with people that we love. And that's what's great about Kensington and about this church is that we value that as well. And so we're going to lead you guys in a song that we get to sing to God because he's worthy of singing. He's worthy of our adoration and our love. So let's sing this together.
man, you guys sounded awesome. Um, we're so excited for the Circle Series. Why don't you turn to the person next to you, give them a high five, and just feel free to have a seat. Check out this video. How many friends do you have on social media? I probably have like 400 followers on Instagram. Not that, like maybe 250. On Twitter, like 1,000. Probably about 700. How many are actual real friends in your life? Anywhere between like 20, 30, something like that. Maybe like 50. 75. People I actually know, probably like 500. Maybe 100. Maybe even less than that. How many are people you could kind of be vulnerable and real with? Mm, probably half that bunch. 25. Probably four or five. Probably 20. Maybe 30 tops. How many could you call at 2 in the morning and know a personal crisis? Oh, uh, probably another half of that. Yeah, about seven or eight. Oh my gosh, like 10. Maybe seven. Those four or five. Those four or five. Maybe five. Yeah, I've saved five of those friends. So today we are kicking off a brand new series called Circles. And uh, what we're doing today is uh, over the next three weeks, we're going to be talking again about your relationships, your friendships, uh, and the people that you are closest to uh, in your life. And so I'm so excited about this series because whether you're a follower of Jesus, you've been a follower of Jesus for a long time, or you're somebody who's new to faith, no matter where you are on that spectrum, what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks really applies specifically uh, to you. And so I'm so excited about it. Now, I'll also tell you this, if it's your first time and you haven't been to Kensington, uh, what we do is we actually kind of take uh, several weeks and just unpack an idea or a series of ideas. And so it's a little bit like a Netflix show. So if you don't, if you kind of come in at the end of it or something like that, or if you miss a week, you can always kind of rewind and binge watch uh, online at kensingtonchurch.org, kind of get caught up uh, on any of those things. But we're so excited about today and what we're going to be doing. So before we jump in too far, though, I wanted to get us all united around one particular idea that we're going to kind of launch from today. And it's an idea that is incredibly important for us just to establish before we start talking about anything. And it's an idea, let me tell you this, it's an idea that's specifically geared to unite every single person in this room, no matter where you are, no matter what you believe about faith, no matter what you believe about God. And the idea is this, I'm going to write it up here. The idea is that most of the important moments in our lives, right, most of our important moments happen within the context of other people. So, right, so most of our important moments happen with other people. Now, this is why this is so important. Because when it comes to our lives and when it comes to our relationships and when it comes to the people in our lives that matter the most, you're not making decisions by yourself, right? You're not making decisions by yourself. In fact, the context of your relationships and the context of, of the things that you're doing in your life are oftentimes a result of relationships that you have with other people. Now, here's how I know that. How many parents do we have in the room? Do you have any parents in the room? Let me hear you real quick. Yeah, parents. Yeah, yeah, you can clap for that. You made a baby. That's great. So... Wish I could have had that second back. All right, so when it comes to your, uh, when it comes to your, uh, when it comes to you that are parents, now here's what I know: you know that this is an important principle, right? Because you parent your kids this way, right? Now here's how you know that. How many of you would say you're kind of like the NSA of your kids' cell phones? Anybody out there? Like you know, you're like watching. You have all of the apps. Your daughter goes on a date. You've got Find My iPhone and a GPS tracker on her and her boyfriend. Like, you've got all of those things going on for you. Um, you uh, if you're a middle school parent, do you have any middle school parents in here? Any middle school parents? You know? Okay. So here's what you do. You're driving, and you've become an expert in this. What, what you've done is you've become an expert in sitting in the car, and as you're sitting in the car, you kind of drop a line to your kids, and you say, what do you guys think about the new Taylor Swift album? And you're just kind of driving, and you just wait to listen to what they say. You are a professional eavesdropper the entire time they're talking, and you find out so much information about your sons and your daughters simply by driving and eavesdropping on the conversation. Like that's just how you do things. Now for me, when it comes to uh, my mom, my mom was very, very smart. And so when I was in sixth grade, uh, I, you can kind of imagine this. I was the most introverted kid, you know, that there was. I was just an introverted guy. Um, and then, uh, and I finally had, a, I mean, like I had this crush on this girl in sixth grade. And so I went to ask her out. Now, if you're a parent of a middle schooler, you know that means absolutely nothing. They're not going anywhere and they're still not talking. So they, and that's a great thing, right? And so I went to ask this girl out and my mom, in all of her wisdom, she goes, that's great. Where are you going? And I'm like, well, I never thought, I didn't think about that part of it, you know? We're just, we're going out, you know? She goes, I think you should take her on a date. 
Now, if you're a middle school parent, you're like, that, that's, that's ludicrous. But my mom was very smart in how she did this. And so what she did is she convinced me to take this girl out for the first time. And so I take this, I ask her out. She had already talked to her mom. We got permission. So we're going to go see a movie. And so my mom decides, here we go. So she gets in our <laughs> early 90s Dodge Caravan. What's up, girl? You know, like that sort of thing. <laughs> and so she pulls up. She picks up uh, me. We pick up the girl. We get in the car, and, uh, and we're, driving, uh, we're driving to the movie theater, and I get out of the car, I open the door for her, and uh, we walk over to, uh, we walk over, I buy her ticket, you know, we get popcorn, because my mom gave me money to get her popcorn, and we kind of make our way into the theater. Now, I'm so excited, like, I'm sitting there in the theater like, oh, yeah, you know, like, I just feel good, and not because I'm going to talk to her and or do anything, I'm just in the movies with a girl, you know? And about 10 minutes kind of into the movie, here's what happens. My mom all of a sudden walks in the theater. And so it's me. I want you to picture no one else in the theater, me and this girl. And my mom walks in, and she sits three rows behind us the entire time. And she's doing this, just popping popcorn like, gotcha. You know what I mean? Like, like she did it. And the reason she did it, right, is because she knew, number one, that relationship was about to end. Number two, she knew this, that when it came to the relationships, the people that I am close to, right? The people that I'm close to, people that I have relationships with, the people that are in my life, whether that be a dating relationship, a friendship, whatever that looks like, the people that I'm close to matter. They just matter to me because what's going to happen is they are going to shape my life. In fact, we could almost say it this way, that the defining moments of your life are often connected to people that are in your life. Now think about this. The defining moments of your life are often connected to an experience or decision that you made with friends. Now think about that for just a minute. And when it comes to you as a parent, you get this and you understand it. But when we get a little bit older, there's something that happens on the inside of us that convinces us or tells us that that's for middle school students or high school students or kids. And we stop paying attention to that truth. What we end up doing in our lives what we end up doing in our lives is just ignoring that principle. But if I were going to ask you this question, when you were in high school or when you were in college, or maybe even for some of you when you were in middle school, if I were to ask you when you had your first drink, right, you would not say that you probably had it by yourself. You would say that you had that with a group of people who were close to you and nearby or around you and influencing you. Isn't that true? Like very few of us made a spouse kind of decision or dating relationship in isolation, right? And I don't understand how girls do this. I don't understand women. You know I don't understand women. I don't have to convince you of that. But ladies, right? When you find a cute guy, what do you do? You circle up with your closest, you know, girlfriends and you have a conversation about it. We showed a video not too long ago. Like they all migrate to the restroom and they have a conversation in there. I don't know what you talk about, but you do that sort of thing. And you're talking about whatever it is that you talk about and the decisions that you talk about. But you didn't make that decision by yourself. You just didn't. Right? When it comes to job or career, same sort of thing. You didn't make those decisions in isolation. You made them with a group of people who were around you. And I think that's incredibly important to recognize. Because whether it's your career, your business, whatever that is that it is in your life, those relationships matter so much. And we can say this. I actually want to leave these slides up here. Can we do that? Yeah, let's, let's throw away iMag. Let's throw these up here real quick. Now, your friendships are more than a part of your past. They shape a better part of your future. And I don't want you to miss this. Your friendships are more than a part of your past. They are going to shape the better part of your future. Now, you know this when it comes to your kids. I don't miss this. You know this when it comes to your kids. But when it comes to us as adults, it is so easy for us to ignore that. It is so easy for us to put that aside and say that's for immature people or that's for kids That's for our students. But in your heart, you know that that's true. Put that slide, let's put that slide back up there. In your heart, you know this is true, that your friendships are more than a part of your past. They're going to shape the better part of your future. Now, that's actually in the Bible as well, right? In an area of the Bible called Proverbs, there's this section where there's all these sort of statements that talk about wise sayings and things that we look at in life. And one of the writers says it like this. It says this. It says, walk with the wise and become wise, for a companion of fools suffers Harm. Now think about this for a second. That those who walk with the wise will ultimately become wise, but a companion of fools will suffer harm. And you know that to be true. But when it comes to our hearts, when it comes to our lives, when it comes to decisions that we make, and I don't miss this, oftentimes what we do is ignore it as adults and don't recognize the power 
that our relationships have in our lives. And so what we're going to do over the next few minutes is we're going to look at an area of the Bible that has this narrative connected to it. And uh, this area of the Bible is in, uh, is in an, area, an area called Kings. And what it does is it kind of gives the biography or these kind of biographical accounts of people who did some things really well. But by and large, it's these accounts of people who had these epic failures in life, right? These epic sort of struggles in life. And there's one person in particular that we're going to look at today who had the opportunity to make an incredibly wise decision, who had the opportunity to make an incredibly wise choice, and then went the opposite direction because of some of the things that happened and the way that he ignored this principle. And the guy that we're going to talk about today is a guy named Rehoboam. Now, I want to talk about Rehoboam for just a minute. Uh, likely, if you haven't read a ton of the Bible, or if you're new to the Bible, you may have not come across Rehoboam. But Rehoboam is fascinating in part because of who his father was and who his grandfather was. So Rehoboam, uh, his father was a guy named Solomon, but his grandfather is a guy named King David. Now, King David is the same David in the Bible with, the, you know, the little young guy, you know, and the big giant, you know, you know boom, falls down, that, that whole story. But then that guy ends up becoming king. And when he becomes king, something begins to shift in the entire nation. He made really, really poor decisions at some points in his life. At some points in his life, he made really, really great decisions as well. But I want you to think about this. Even though he wasn't perfect, he led the kingdom to a time in a lot of ways of prosperity, and he led the kingdom in a lot of ways uh, to where it went really, really well for them. Now, let's put that back up on the screen. Let's, let's leave the slides if we can. can we do that? Um, so Rehoboam did, uh, did, did that. Now, his son, or uh, David's son, was a guy named David, right? Uh, I'm sorry. Rehoboam, I'm getting confused now. Sorry. David's son was Solomon. Solomon's son was Rehoboam. David's son, uh, Solomon, was a guy who came and followed David in the kingdom. Now, what happens with Solomon is fascinating. You know, some people would talk about Solomon in terms of him being like a genius. He was this brilliant military strategist. He was an economic strategist. He was extraordinarily wise. He was very powerful, very wealthy, and he led this kingdom into a time that was very prosperous, right? Like when it comes to the economic side of this, he led them to build extraordinary things. He led them financially to do extraordinary things. They did things that made you go, wow, that was amazing. And there's this whole part of Solomon's leadership and kingdom that was so amazing. But then there's other part of Solomon's kingdom that was very like, oh, he's oppressive to a group of people to try to get this thing done. He's kind of like that boss that you've had at some point in your life that you're like, he was just constantly doing this to you. Except if you take that and you multiply it by about 50, that would have been how some people felt towards Solomon. And as Solomon ended the near of his, or ended the, his life, Rehoboam was going to step in and be the leader of this kingdom. And it's at that point that you begin to look, you begin to discover that he's walking in into some ways a complex situation. That in any leader walking into that, it would have been complex. But for this man to walk in and follow Solomon, who led him to a time of prosperity, and his famous grandfather, King David, it was going to be in some ways a difficult task to do. And so we're going to pick up right in the narrative as some of this begins to unfold uh, at the early part of Rehoboam's leadership. Now, here's what it says in 1 Kings chapter 12. It says, the whole assembly of Israel went to Rehoboam and said to him, it says, your father put a heavy yoke on us. Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but now lighten the harsh labor and the heavy yoke he put on us. And I want you to say this with me. And he will what? Or, and we will what? Serve. serve you. And we will serve you. Now, this isn't just an action sort of thing. Like, we will serve you isn't just kind of like, we're going to bow down to you. Or we're going to do whatever you want. What this assembly of people who are kind of speaking for the broader, uh, the broader audience that Rehoboam was leading, this assembly was speaking on behalf of them. And saying, not only will we serve you, but you will ultimately have our heart. That if you'll adopt a different approach to leadership than your father did, that if you'll show empathy to us and kindness, and you'll remove kind of that harsh hand that your father had, not only will we serve you, but you, in a lot of ways, will have credibility and influence and have our heart. Now, let me ask you this question. How many of you ever worked for somebody who not only would you do anything for them, but they led you in certain ways where you had, or they had, your heart. Like you'd run through a brick wall for them if they simply told you to do it. Then when they said, hey, jump, you're like, not only am I going to jump, but how high do you want me to jump? That you're going to take their call even when it's after hours because you respect them and admire them, and they have your heart. Well, this assembly is really offering Rehoboam in this moment is that kind of thing. 
that not only will we follow you, but we'll want to follow you. And not only will we want to follow you, but we'll follow you with love and gladness and trusting you in those moments. And here's Rehoboam's response. He says this. He says, Rehoboam answered, go away for three days and then come back to me. And so the people went away. Now, this is actually a brilliant move on his part. Probably learned this from his dad. He's saying, you know what? That's interesting, and I think that's a great thing, and obviously I would love all of those things. But there's been an enormous amount of prosperity in the kingdom, and the way that my father led led us to the place that we are, are, and there's a lot of ways that that's a good thing. Economic prosperity, that's a good thing. The way that we've approached some of these things, that's a good thing. What would I have to give up to be able to follow you in this way? And so what he does, he says, let me take a step back, and I'm going to ask for wise counsel. He felt the weight of the decision, and he needed clarity. And then he does what wise leaders do, and he asks for counsels of others. And here's what it says. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders, I don't miss this, who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. It's a brilliant move. He doesn't go after just anybody. He goes after the people who watched his father do amazing things, who watched his father triumph over extraordinary odds, who watched his father fail, who watched his father's heart in the good times and the bad times. He consults the people who were closest to the action. He consults them and he said this, how would you advise me to answer these people? Or another way of saying that is this, if you were me, what would you do? Now, kind of a sidebar, for those of you who are leaders or aspire to be leaders in the room, this is one of the absolute best questions that you could ever ask anybody who you're leading. Like, if you were me, how would you handle this or what would you have me to do? And not only that, but the further down the organization you can ask that question, oftentimes the better answers you're going to get and the more clarity you're going to get. He's actually operating with a lot of wisdom at this section looking at his father's closest advisors and saying, what would you have me to do? And here's their response. They said this, if today you will be a servant to these people and serve them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your, what's that word? Or you will always have their heart. That if you'll lead with empathy, And if you'll lead with humility, then you will have their heart. What he does is he has this inner circle of advisors and friends and people. And he invites his father's elders to speak into that with their wisdom to make a decision. Which is this beautiful, very wise thing. But here's what he does next. The writer goes on and says, but Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with serving with him and were serving him. Now, I don't want you to miss this. What he does next is he not only ignores what they said, but he rejects the advice that they gave. And he looks to his inner circle that he currently has. And when he looks to that inner circle that he currently has, he says, what would you have me to do? And they give him the stark opposite kind of advice that they were given. Here's what they said to him. He said, what is your advice, talking to these young men? How would you answer these people who say to me, lighten the yoke that your father put on us? Let's go to the next slide real quick. Let's go to the next one if we can. The young men who had grown up with him replied this way. He said, these people have said to you, your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Now, if you're looking at that last line, you're going, that doesn't make sense. It's because it doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense if you don't know really kind of the Hebrew ideas around what this means. This is one of those awkward moments in the Bible that you don't really read your kids at night. Because what they're talking about is this this euphemism kind of thing, this locker room kind of talk, this comparison of things that you don't talk about that in church, but you sang friends earlier, so you're at that kind of church, right? This is what they said, that you're comparing yourself as a man to your father. And he's saying, well, tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. And this group of people began to lead him down a path extraordinarily difficult. And it goes on, it says this in the next verse. My father laid on you a heavy yoke, but I will make it even heavier. My father scores you with whips, but I will scourge you with scorpions. Now there's a principle that's lying kind of deep 
within this conversation that I want to talk about today, and that's this. And when it comes to your relationships, you really got kind of three sets in the way that we're going to think about it through this series. Three types of people that are your friends in, in this area. So we're going to talk about this top, uh, this top area as if these are the people that are just your friends. Now let me ask you real quick, how many of you would say that you have a Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter account? Anybody have a Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter account? That's great. Now, if you were really honest, how many of you would say, I don't really know everybody that I'm friends with on Facebook, Twitter, and or Instagram, like really well, right? That's great. Now, let me ask you this one. This is a fun one. You've got to be honest. I'll be honest with you. How many of you simply use Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter to slightly stalk other people from childhood? Anybody? You are fitting. Yeah, that's great, right? So you kind of have this. This is like a group of friends. Some of you have 500 friends, 100 friends, 3,000 friends. And you're like, I kind of know this guy that we kind of met at that one thing. Or we were in third grade together, I think. What happened? You know, like that sort of thing, you know? Like your friends at that level, that's kind of the outer circle. These are the people that are the least influential in your life out of these three subgroups. And then there's this other way that you can kind of talk about this next circle of influence. Uh, now, I, I talked to a lot of people, and this phrase has kind of come about in the last year and a half, which I think is a fun phrase to use for this group of people. You may use it, you may not, but the way that it's talked about oftentimes now is that these are my people, right? You ever heard that phrase? Like, I'm looking for my people at your church. I'm looking at my people in that small group. I'm looking for my people. Now, I'm not exactly sure what that means, but here's what I do know. That my people are more influential on you than your friends. That these are the types of people that are in my life that I'm close to. And they're not really my Facebook friends. These are the people that will text me. And I'll call them. And we'll have conversations with. These are my people. And they're influential in your life. And they're incredibly important. But they're not the most important relationships that you have. The most important relationships that you have, the people group that are the most important to you, are what we talk about at Kensington as if they are your two AM friends, right? Now, your two AM friends are the ones that really influence you. These are the people that you could call at 2 AM, and they're not going to swear at you because it's 2 AM, right? These are the people that you call at 2 AM, and they're like, you know what, where you at? I'll be there. These are the people that you can be vulnerable with and you can say, you know what, I'm struggling with and I haven't even told my spouse yet. These are the people that show up in your life when it matters the most. These are the people who you ask advice of. These are the people who you say, hey, if you were me, what would you do? And what Rehoboam does is he may or may not have acknowledged this idea, but what he does is he has two groups of people in that innermost circle. One of them being the friends that he has that are leading him in the direction towards more harshly leading the kingdom. And the other group of people that he invited into that 2 a.m. list that he rejects and says, that's not the way. I'm going to go. Now the principle around this is that that 2 a.m. group of people that Rehoboam has would greatly shape his life and the life of the kingdom. In fact, we could say it like this. Array of Boehm's inner circle would shape his life and the life of all of those people that are affected by his leadership. Now, you know this to be true with your kids. For those of you who are parents, you know the relationships that your kids have with other people, it's going to shape their middle school experience, their high school experience. The same is true for you. Now, I know that that's true of you because it's easy for us to see in other people, isn't it? Like how many of you have watched somebody else walk a road and you see who's close to them and you go, I know where that's headed. Like you apply this with your high school student, but we reject it as adults or we ignore it as adults because we think we're mature enough. Now, the truth is you're not. And I'm not. None of us move beyond the maturity level for us to pay attention to who our 2 a.m. friends are. The reason that you press so deeply into your middle school or in high school or with this principle, the reason that your parents did that for you is because they know that it matters. Those of you who hang out with people that are gossips, you are much more likely to gossip. Fellas, those of you in the room who watch pornography or have friends who watch pornography, you're much more likely to engage in that if the people who are in your 2 a.m. friend group do as well. If you're entertaining people who are in this area of your life, that innermost circle, and I'll miss this, 
you're more likely to become who they are. Now, there's something in you, and I know this because I'm the same way that resists that idea or thinks that you have it together right now, right? Like if I were sitting there, I'd be doing the exact same thing. That's not me, right? But think about the conversations that you've had over the past week. Where are those conversations led you to? What are they talking about? What are they doing? It matters. Here's the consequences to Rehoboam's decisions. Here's what it says. When all Israel saw that the king, being Rehoboam, refused to listen to them, they answered him. And they didn't answer him with only words. They answered him with actions. And they said, what share do we have in David? What part in Jesse's son? Now watch this. To your tents, Israel. Look after your own house, David. We are on our own. They look at Rehoboam and say, we are on our own. And they rebel against him. In a powerful way. But then there's this fascinating word in these verses for us to look at that I think really outlines what happens when we ignore it. And the word is this. The word is so. Because of the decisions that he made, because of what he did, because he neglected his inner circle, there's the so, or there's the consequence that comes to those actions. And here's what the writer says. So, the Israelites went home. Now, here's why this is so important. You know, because some of you are like battling with me in your head, which I love because I do that to people. Anybody who speaks, I do that with them, and it's fun. The reason this is so important is because no matter what your past is, your future is going to be shaped by the people that are in your innermost circle. And you don't know. Come on. You don't know what your future holds. You don't know what hangs in the balance of your decision to ignore where your friends are taking you. For some of you, now come on, come on. For some of you, it's your family. You don't even know it yet. But if you were to fast forward in the direction that your friends are currently taking you, they are moving you away toward Jesus' best plan for your life, and you don't even know it yet. But if you were to fast forward a year or two years or five years, the story that you're going to tell is a story that you don't want to tell. Oftentimes we think that our decisions like this only affect us and that they're temporary. But the truth of the matter is this. I don't miss this. Every decision that you make becomes a part of your story. Every choice that you make becomes a part of your story. And here's how you know that. Ask somebody whose marriage had an affair in it. I don't miss me. Ask somebody. And there is redemption and there is grace and there's God doing amazing things. I don't miss this. And God redeems the brokenness in a way that is beyond human understanding. But that does not erase that part of the story. Ask someone like me who grew up in a family without a father at all. And though there is grace and redemption and God moving, that is still a part of the story. Ask someone who makes financial decisions that affect the rest of their life and how long they're going to have to work and the retirement pieces of this. I'm going to miss it. Though there is grace and redemption and God brings beauty from those difficult pieces, it is a part of the story and it's a part of our regret. I wish there was a place in the Bible that said God removes all the consequences as soon as we ask for forgiveness. But the truth of the matter is that when it comes to our lives on earth, we still experience the weight of a lot of those consequences. And that's exactly what happened to Rehoboam. That it wasn't temporary and it didn't just go away. That it affected him, but it didn't just affect him. It affected all of the people whose lives were around him in the entire kingdom. The writer chronicles it this way, and he says this. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. Why? Because Rehoboam's inner circle would shape his life in the life of the kingdom. So here's what I want to tell you. Is you could continue as an adult to move through your life and ignore this. And some of you will. Some of you, and we, we know that. Some, some of you walk out and you do that. But at some point, I believe this because I've seen it. You know, part of being a pastor, you get to have all sorts of conversations with people. I have conversations all the time. You, you, you hear and you experience brokenness. And I think this, I really do. In my experience, most of the time, you find yourself at a breaking point later on in life after you've ignored it, where it almost forces you to acknowledge that which you've ignored throughout your life. 
Like that just, that ends up happening. And that happens to a lot of people. And that part of some of you, that's your story. Like God, at, at some point you experience this breaking point in your life and then you turn it on. But here's, here's my thing for you. If you're sitting here today, you have a moment, moment to experience this catalytic thing to move your life in a completely different direction. At any point through this process, before he made the decision, Rehoboam could have turned and adjusted the sales. He could have kept his influence, and he didn't. But you're here. And I believe that if you're here, it's, I think it's because God probably wants you to be here to hear this. Some of you, you need to course correct right now, and you need to pay attention to that inner circle in such a powerful way. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you three kind of ideas around how to make sure that you're navigating these relationships in a, in a very healthy way and then making sure that you know, and I don't mess this, who needs to be in your inner circle of those 2 a.m. friends. Let me just give you these. The first one is this. The close proximity to the why or to wise people puts you in close proximity to a life of wisdom. I want to say that again. This is the part of the, the, the thing where a lot of people pull out their phones and start taking pictures of the slides. This is when you would do that. Let me tell you, these are one of the things I want you to remember. Close proximity to wise people puts you in close proximity to a life of wisdom. Now, let me explain this a little bit. I came across this principle in high school for the first time. I had a student pastor. His name was Jay. Jay set me down at the best restaurant that's ever been created, Chick-fil-A, over sweet tea. And what he said to me was this. He said, close proximity to wise people puts you in close proximity to wisdom. Now, now here's what this meant for me. He said, every season of your life, every season of your life, you're going to find yourself in areas where you don't know what the next step to take is. And it's going to be in the most important areas. There's going to be times where you don't know financially what to do. There's going to be times relationally you don't know what to do. There's going to be times as a dad you don't know what to do. You need to surround yourself with wise people. And then he said this, and I love this. He says, and nobody is wise at every area. That's just true. Like, we're just not all the wisest people in every area of our life. And he says, so you need to find people that can do that. You need to identify what those areas of your life are that are the most important in that season, and you need to get wise people around you for that. So I'll tell you what I did. I've been doing this since I was in high school, and I I still do it to this day. What I've identified in my life is financially it matters. So I have a person that I talk to about finances specifically, and I ask them questions around how to do this. Now, it's not that I walk out of there with all of like, this is the exact how do and the form- how to do it, and there's a formula, even though there's some of that. And it's not about catchy phrases, because catchy phrases are great, but mm, whatever, you know. But here's what it's about. It's about being in close proximity to people who've done it well. And there's something kind of weirdly supernatural, and if you don't you know, believe that, that's okay, just try it. I think you'll experience it. There's something about just being around wise people that makes you wiser. Their wisdom is contagious. It's transferable, and you just begin to get it when you're around wise people. I do that when it comes to finances. My, my son, he's a little over a year, kind of moving towards that year and a half. I have somebody that I talk to about how to raise a one-and-a-half-year-old because I've never done that. And when he hits three, and I've noticed this, I'm going to move to a different person because I love the person that I talked about this now. Hopefully they're not watching, you know, but I'm kidding. But they're, they're, they're great at this. I don't know that they know three-year-olds yet, but when I get to three-year-olds, we're going to talk about what it means to raise a boy at three years old. When it comes to my marriage, we've gone through different seasons. It's different when you're newly married than when you have a, a kid and you sleep about two and a half hours a night. It's a different thing, you know? And so I talk to somebody who's walked that season well. I do that in the areas of my life. I do that when in leadership. I do it with pastoral stuff. That's what I do. And I'll tell you this. It's not because I'm trying to get a bunch of catchy phrases, even though I take notes the whole time. It's because I want to be around wise people who've done it well. And there's something, there's just something, he's, he's so right. There's something that just happens when you place yourself in proximity to wise people. All right, here's the second principle, and that's this. Uh, and I didn't write this. I wish I did. This is by a guy named Andy Stanley who pastors a church in Atlanta. He says this, friends who are careless with their lives will be careless with yours. Let me say it one more time. Friends who are careless with their lives will be careless with yours. I don't miss this. That means if they're careless with their marriage, when you go to them to ask for advice about your marriage, they're going to be careless with the advice that they give you about yours. That means when it comes to financially, Come on, come on. If they're careless for their finances, they're going to be careless about yours. When it comes to health, you know, they're going to be careless with your life around that. And you don't want those kind of people in your 2 a.m. friend group. You just don't. Why? Because it's going to lead you away from God's best in your life. Now, I want to, I want to talk real quick 
I'm going to talk to men. I'm going to talk to women. Men, I think I have a little bit more speaking rights. Women, I'm going to ask for grace as we talk about it. But fellas, let me, ask, let me say this. I talked about pornography. We talk about sex. We talk about all sorts of things, specifically with manhood. But let me tell you this. When it comes to the people that you interact with on a consistent basis, and don't listen, you are not above the temptations that you judge them for. You're not. You're not above the temptations that you judge them for. As a single man in this room, you're not above the temptations that you judge other men for, for what they've done to their wives. That, that's, that's true. You're just not. But if the people that you're surrounding yourself with are engaged in those kinds of things, if they're engaged in entertaining themselves with sex outside of marriage, if they're engaged in pornography, if they're engaged with the dirty junk, come on, I get it, all that sort of stuff, I'm telling you, it will shape the way you view women, and it will shape the course and direction of your life. And if those are the people that you keep in your 2 a.m. friend group, I want to tell you this. Am I saying you're going to have an affair? I'm not saying that. Am I saying that it's going to affect you? I'm absolutely saying that. It will shape your heart and it will shape your life. And don't miss this. And you need people who are different than that here. All right, now, ladies, let me talk to you real quick. This is fun, so don't throw stones at me, but I'm going to say this, right? I don't know a lot about women, but I know a little bit about men. And what I see everyone, I could, I, we could talk about a thousand different things, I don't know that. But if you're married, if you hope to be married, you know, if you were married and you want to be married again, like wherever you're at on the married relationship, one relationship kind of thing, I want to tell you this. Men desire respect. They just do. Which means the joke that you have when you cut him down in front of his friends, he was like, you're like, oh, that was funny. But he's like, like there's something deflating about it. No, 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 no. And I talk to them all the time. And, they, and they, sometimes they do this sort of thing. They don't even know that they're doing it. But part of the reason they do it is because they've surrounded themselves with other women who do it. And there's this whole thing that's going on. You don't even realize the intimacy is kind of eroding. You don't even realize what's going on. I don't miss this. And you surround yourself with women who talk bad about their husbands. I'm going to tell you, that is never going to be good for you. For you. Right? There's something that dies inside of your husband every time you make that joke. And you're like, no, you don't know. And he's not going to admit it because he's strong. You know, he's whatever. You know, he's that. I'm just telling you. When you surround yourself with people that do that, that is a tiny little thing that will damage your marriage and relationships. What would it look like for you to surround your inner circle with other women who honor and respect and not some weird, like, oh, not in that sort of apron kind of way. That's not what I'm talking about, right? Even though that's great, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the moments where you find women who say, you know what, I am choosing to honor him when he's in the room, when he's not in the room, and we talk about the difficult stuff together. And drop. Okay. If you do that, I don't miss. You're going to experience better marriage than the people who ignore this specifically in this area. And the last one, and then we'll wrap up, is high school students. If you're a high school student or a middle school student in the room, some of you, I believe some are, some of you are leaders and you don't even know that you're leaders yet. Some of you are leaders in this room and you didn't even realize it, and maybe somebody's told you, maybe they haven't. But at some point along the way, something came inside of you and people follow you and you don't know why. You're the captain of the team, you're the president of the student body, you're the popular kid at school, whatever that is, there's something in you. And here's what I'm going to tell you. And I want you to mark this down. Most of your friends will never think about this and who goes here. They won't. Most of them won't. Most of your friends will never acknowledge how much this shapes their lives. But don't miss this. But if as a middle school student and as a high school student, don't miss this, as a middle school student and a high school student, you get this right, I'm going to tell you, God will begin, or you, and the way that you follow him in obedience, God will begin to protect your life for the influence that he's preparing you to have if you guard this. And what this means is that you're going to have to make decisions that other people aren't willing to make. You're going to feel alone at times. You're going to feel by yourself at times. You're going to struggle at times. But at the end of the day, what you're going to find is that the people who protect this experience the kind of life that God designed them to experience because God did not design you to experience the kind of regret some of you have experienced in your past. And this principle, we say it like this, is difficult, but it is absolutely necessary for you to engage in. And the, the hard part about this is it's emotional, but it's 100% essential for experiencing the kind of life that God wants you to live. Because God never intended for you to sin and experience that kind of regret. I don't miss this. He wants you to experience the life that he's called you to live. And you will, now come on, you will never, ever, 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 ever experience that kind of life 
until you surround yourself with people who are leading you in the direction that God wants you to go in. You can ignore it, you can apply it, but at the end of the day, there will be a moment when you wish you decided to surround yourself with people who are leading you towards God's best for your life. So the principle that I want you to remember, and we're going to wrap up in a second, is this. That our future is most shaped by those who are closest to us. You've got work to do in figuring out who goes into those circles. You've got work to do in figuring out how you navigate it. But your future will 100% be affected and shaped by the people who you put in that closest area of your life. So here's my question to you. I, uh, some of you, you came in here, and as I've been talking about the past and regret sort of stuff, there's something inside of your heart that you're like, I've made so many mistakes and I have so much baggage and I've sitting in so much financial debt or I've actually made those decisions that have seemed like they've ruined my marriage or we've struggled with this kind of stuff. And here's what I want to tell you. And here's what I want to say. Is no matter what you've done in the past, again, God can redeem it. But the beautiful part about the consequences thing that's kind of laid out in First Kings and all throughout the Bible is that there's these catalytic moments that you can't erase what's happened in your past, but you get to experience a different future. Some of you, you're going to have to tell your kids one day about the difficulties that you experienced in the past, but there will be a moment where you will either say, and then there was this, or so there was that day when I decided to follow Jesus into his best for my life. I decided that I was going to pay attention to my 2 a.m. friends. And I was going to move in the direction that he called me to move in. That's some of you. Some of you, you need to embrace the fact that you can't change the past, but you 100% can shape where you're headed in the future. There's a second group of you, and you're a lot like me. You're introverted, and when it comes to, like, engaging in community or small groups, you agree with it, but you're just like, I'm not going to be vulnerable. I've been hurt in the past. And, you know, I tell my wife all the time, I was like, every time small group night comes up, I love the people that we're with. I never wake up in the morning and go, I get to share my heart tonight. Like, that's just not me, right? I don't get to do that. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Some of you, you need to do that out of a discipline first. And the reason that you're doing it is so that you can protect this, so that you can surround yourself with people who are going to guide you into the direction that God has for your life. You need to make the decision to be vulnerable with other people. And the last group that I want to talk to, and we're going to end, is there some of you that are just busy, and I get it, like we did the church adoption and we had a baby. We had a baby. My wife had a baby. He's a year old. And we moved three times and it's busy. It's bu- I know you're busy. Some of you feel like all you do is drive a minivan all day long. And I'm like, fellas, I know, right? And you got so much stuff and you got so many things you're going after. And you've never prioritized, not only thinking about this, but being around a group of people that are going to push you in the direction that you know you need to go. And I'm going to tell you this. Doing that is flirting with disaster. You were busying yourself right out of protecting your family. And I know this about you, right? You would want to protect your family. You want to protect your relationships. You want to protect your future. Don't out-busy yourself into prioritizing what's most important. And what's most important is for you to surround yourself with a group of people that are going to push you in the direction that you need to go. So what I want to do is I want to pray for you. Uh, and then Ryan and the band, Carrie, they're going to come out. Uh, we're going to sing a song. And the song that we're going to sing is a song called Glory to Glory. And, and what it does, which I love about it, is it, it kind of outlines what a catalytic moment looks like. It kind of says that we don't have to be the same anymore. That God moves us in direction from moment to moment in our lives where we can pursue him into the area of our lives that we're ultimately more submitted to him and experiencing his will. So what I'm going to ask you to do if you're a follower of Jesus in the room, I'm going to ask you to sing that out with everything you have. And I'm going to ask you to sing it as a prayer because someone around you might have that catalytic moment. Some of you, that's your moment today that you need to take a next step. And for those of you who are not followers of Jesus, what I would ask you to do over these next few moments as we sing this out is you can sing along. We'd love for you to do that. But to look at these words on the screen and to see what we believe about God, but not only that, but to see what we believe that God believes about you in these next few moments. So let me pray for us. We're going to sing this song. We'll wrap up our time together. Father, um, God, we thank you for this truth. God, we thank you for uh, all the people who were involved in writing the text that we have that is the Bible. I thank you for the stories of men and women who followed you. Thank you for the stories of men and women who decided not to follow you and struggled through things. 
God, we thank you that this was preserved for us to understand how we can better interact with you and interact with our world and those around us. And so, Father, I pray specifically for the person here. I pray specifically for the person here who struggles with vulnerability, that's never jumped into a small group, partly because they just don't want to be vulnerable with other people. And God, I just ask that you would make today the day that they decide to protect their future story. God, that you would help them to figure out what that means for them and how they navigate it. Father, I pray for the person in this room who, uh, it's not just about vulnerability, they're just so busy, God, and I, I understand that that's tough, but I just ask, that again, that they would protect their future, that they would look out of their future and intentionally surround themselves with people who are going to push them in the direction they need to go and, and remove the people that don't need to be there. And God, I especially pray for every person in this room who looks at their story and they look at their past and it just feels like it's full of regret. I pray for the people in this room who are sitting here today and they're like, I know that you're saying it's redeemable, but I don't believe that it is. I pray for that person. And I just ask that in these next few moments that you would overwhelm them and flood them with emotions and truth. It causes them to take a next step and realize that redemption is possible and that a future story can be different. And that's what you do. I pray for the people in this room that are going to choose to follow you today and not just with a prayer and not just with words, but choose to follow you into the life that you're calling them to live. And I pray that in these next few moments that we would just experience what it's like as a community to say with our mouths what we believe is going to happen in all of our lives, that you are calling us into the future that you want us to have. We're going to invite you to stand and we're going to sing this together.
So here's my challenge to you. Some of you are here and you're like, you know what? I know that I need to take a next step. I know specifically I need to make it take a next step towards community. So here's my challenge. You're going to be tempted to like leave here because it's busy or the parking lot's busy. Or you're going to rush to go get your kids and then you're going to wait. So here's my challenge to you. I'm going to ask you, if you're not involved in a small group yet, if you're not involved in a consistent community yet, I'm going to ask you to take that step before you leave and specifically make sure you take that step before you eat your first bite of food today, right? That's my goal for you. So if you're going to Chili's, before you eat some of that amazing cookie skillet, I don't know, any of that sort of thing, right? I'm going to ask you to take a step before you do that. And the reason is because the longer you wait, the less likely you are to actually take the step. And this is so important for you. So out in the lobby, you can get to our info center. If it's your first time, you go to Starting Point and even take a next step there. Uh, Craig Lang, who's our discipleship director, he works with groups a lot here. He'd love to get you connected, but I'm challenging you to get connected today before you take that first step bite of food. Thank you so much for being here. We'll see you right back here next Sunday for part two of Circles. And again, thanks so much. We'll see you next week. Thank you so much for watching online. Again, we know that so many of you watch week in and week out. You're liking the content, sharing the content. Thanks so much for partnering with us in that way. I want to let you know two things today. If you're sitting at home or you're in a coffee shop or wherever you're at, and you're like, you know what? That's me. I need to take a next step towards community. Uh, we've made that as easy as we possibly could uh, for you on our website. So if you're in Traverse City, if you are in Metro Detroit, or if you're in Orlando, you can simply go to kiddingandchurch.org to find more information about what kind of group you can get a part of and even join a group very soon there. If you're not in one of those areas, we'd love for you to find a local church wherever you are. And so you can go to several different churches there. You can find a small group, but the big thing is to connect with people who are like you in community and can push you forward to what God's calling you to do. The second thing is we know a lot of you are wanting to get involved in what's going on with Houston. Kensington is a great way to do that. There's a lot of other areas you can, but if you're interested in giving towards that, 100% of those proceeds go directly to those two churches that are in Houston and on the ground. So we'd love to invite you to do that as well. Again, you can go to kensingtonchurch.org to find out more information about that. You can do it on the app or you can do it through a text message as well. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you right back here next Sunday.